recommendations. Here is a markup session in the House Government Reform Committee on creating a central authority to grant security clearances and make national standards for driver's licenses. This is just over four hours. today to consider H.R. 3281, the Federal Employee Protection of Disclosures Act, and H.R. 10, the 9-11 Recommendation Implementation Act. Before I begin, I want to welcome the Honorable Dr. Michael Burgess from Texas and uh, the Deputy Whip Eric Cantor from the Commonwealth of Virginia to the committee. We appreciate you all being uh, with us. I also want to note uh, he's not here, uh, but when he comes in that it's John McHugh's birthday today. Uh, he'll be arriving late uh, from the markup due to the DOD conference. The committee will now consider H.R. 3281, the Federal Employee Protection of Disclosures Act, introduced by Congressman Todd Platts of Pennsylvania. This legislation reiter reiterates Congress's commitment to protecting federal employees from retaliation for reporting on waste, fraud, uh, and criminal activity and the like. Federal employees must feel protected if they're willing to come forward and blow the whistle. Such employees are our first line of defense in protecting the interests of the taxpayer, engendering trust in government, and ensuring government runs as efficiently as possible. This, they provide a valuable service. Getting to this point has been a long process, and it's not always been an easy one, but I appreciate the minority's willingness to negotiate these issues in good faith and to work to come up with reasonable compromises. The bill we're presenting today as a substitute to the original legislation is a responsible bill that takes a stand for whistleblowers. The bill makes clear Congress's intent that any whistleblowing disclosure truly means any, no matter how, when, or where uh, the report is made. It also addresses specific concerns about how whistleblowers can protect themselves from retaliation through legal action if they have to. Finally, the legislation requires a study to determine how often security clearances have been revoked in retaliation for whistleblowing. The revocation of a security clearance, of course, can be fatal to an employee's career. Uh, this legislation will help protect whistleblowers and reassure them that Congress values their courage and understands the risks they take. Mr. Waxman, any opening statement? Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for bringing H.R. 3281, the Federal Employee Protection of Disclosures Act, before the committee. This is long overdue. This legislation will strengthen the protections for federal whistleblowers that disclose information about gross government waste, fraud, and abuse. Federal employees must be able to sound the alarm on wrongdoing within the government without fear of retaliation. In 1994, Congress strengthened the Whistleblower Protection Act. However, court decisions interpreting the whistleblower law have weakened those protections over the last 10 years. Passage of H.R. 3281 will affirm the intent of Congress to protect federal workers who do the right thing. Particularly now, with heightened concerns about national security, we need an environment that encourages employees to speak up about dangers to public health and safety or government abuses. This legislation will help us achieve that goal. Although I am very pleased that we are passing this bill today, I want to quickly mention my procedural concerns. We are sending this bill to the floor without a proper markup. I would have preferred an opportunity for committee members to offer amendments. Having said that, I appreciate the chairman's willingness to work with me to make changes to the bill, and I hope that we'll be able to get this bill to the floor next week before we leave for uh, the elections and uh, in the process uh, make some changes in it that uh, would be mutually agreeable. Therefore, I urge members to agree to pass H.R. 3281 out of committee and look forward to working closely with the chairman to uh, pass this bill on the floor next week. Mr. Waxman, thank you very much. We're going to now, um, well, I'll hold the record open until the end of the day for many me members who want to uh, submit a written statement. We're going to open the bill for consideration, and with that objection, 3281 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I recognize Mr. Platts, the bill's author, for the purpose of offering amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can uh, offer a statement for opposition. Yes, you, well, why don't you call up your amendment first okay. and then speak. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The and amendment has been distributed and without objection, the amendment will be considered read and original text for purposes of amendment. Mr. Platts, you recognize for five minutes to explain your 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, certainly appreciate your efforts in bringing this bill up for consideration here today. Uh, H.R. 3281, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, is a bipartisan bill which seeks to restore protections for federal employees who report illegalities, gross mismanagement, and waste, and substantial and specific dangers to the public health and safety. It is the House companion uh, piece of legislation to Senate Bill 2628, introduced in the Senate by Senators Daniel Akaka and Charles Grassley. The Senate bill was approved unanimously by the Senate Committee on Government Affairs on July 21, 2004. Uh, this substitute amendment that I'm offering here today is a compromise which has grown out of discussions between Chairman Davis and myself, the majority and minority staffs, and interested stakeholders such as the Government Accountability Project. I'd like to thank all parties who are involved in this effort. Although the substitute amendment does not contain all the provisions I'd hoped for, it is a solid step in the right direction. Passage out of committee today will hopefully put us in a position to come to an agreement with the Senate and enhance protections for federal whistleblowers before the end of the 108th Congress. To provide context for the legislation we are considering today, it is important to review the legislative history in the area of whistleblower protections for federal employees. As a result of findings that the civil service protections of the time are inadequate, Congress in the first Bush administration enacted into law the Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989, which expressly stated that, quote, any, unquote, protected disclosure of waste, fraud, and abuse by federal employees is covered by the law. Unfortunately, as interpreted by the Merit Systems Protection Board and the Federal Circuit Court, which has monopoly jurisdiction over whistleblower appeals, loopholes began to develop in the WPA. Accordingly, Congress strengthened the law in 1994. It is noteworthy that the report accompanying the WPA amendments of 1994 expressed great frustration with the way WPA was being interpreted by the MSPB and the Federal Circuit. According to the report, perhaps the most troubling pre precedents involve the Board's inability to understand that any means any. The WPA protects any disclosure evidencing a reasonable belief of sp specified misconduct, a cornerstone to which the MSPB remains blind. The only restrictions are for classified information or material, the release of which is specifically prohibited by statute. Employees must disclose that type of information through confidential channels to maintain protection. Otherwise, there are no exceptions. Unfortunately, we are once again largely back to where we started. Since the 1994 amendments, 75 whistleblower cases have come before the Federal Circuit Court. However, only one whistleblower has prevailed. Among the reasons are a number of decisions which have continued to create exceptions to the law, including decisions stating that an employee is not protected by the WPA if, one, the employee directs criticism to other witnesses or a supervisor in an attempt to start the process of challenging misconduct, or two, the information disclosed was done in the course of the employee's ordinary job duties, or three, the information disclosed has already been raised by someone else. In addition, the Federal Circuit has stated that for a federal employee to reasonably believe there is evidence of waste, fraud, and abuse as required by the law, he or she must have overcome with irrefragable proof the presumption that the agency was acting in good faith. This is an unheard of legal standard defined in the dictionary as impossible to refute. In other words, the agency pretty much has to admit to the waste, fraud, or abuse. The substitute amendment I offer here today, like the underlying legislation, would clarify congressional intent that any whistleblower disclosure includes disclosures without restriction to time, place, form, motive, context, or prior disclosure made to any person by an employee or applicant, including a disclosure made in the ordinary course of an employee's duties. Also, like the underlying bill, the substitute amendment would replace the irrefragable proof standard with a much more common standard of showing substantial evidence. Other provisions within the amendment would codify an anti-gag rule that has been a rider in every Treasury appropriations bill since 1988, expressly prohibit retaliatory investigations of employees, continue protections for whistleblowers who were subjected to prohibited personnel actions prior to their agency or unit being exempted from the WPA, and require a GAO study to determine the extent to which security clearances are revoked due to protected whistleblowing. In conclusion, I'd like to once again thank each of the parties who have been, been involved in the ongoing development of this legislation. I would also like to thank those courageous citizens who have exposed waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal government by becoming whistleblowers. Mr. Chairman, I again thank you personally 
and I look forward to continuing to work with you and your staff. I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, anyone else wish to be recognized? I, see, I see time. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Waxman, members of the committee, I'm uh, here in support of H.R. 3281, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. The goal of this bill is to protect the Congressional Right to Know Law, the Lloyd LaFollette Act of 1912. That law's purpose is to protect the free flow of information to Congress, the lifeblood for Congress to carry out its mission. While the law prohibits discrimination for communicating with Congress, it fails to specifically provide access to court for enforcement of Lloyd LaFollette rights. As a result, it has been a right without a remedy. While various whistleblower statutes provide administrative remedies, coverage has been hit or miss. Administrative boards have been subject to partisan pressures and have had limited judicial review. How can we expect whistleblowers to protect the public if they cannot defend themselves? The right to communicate with leaders is an essential right of citizenship in a democracy. This right can only be protected if those courageous citizens who speak out to defend the public are allowed their day in court. A court of law will provide judicial independence. A jury of citizens, those that the whistleblower has aimed to protect, will judge whistleblowers. H.R. 3281 would authorize the Merit Systems Protection Board or any reviewing court for federal employees to determine if a personnel violation against a whistleblower occurred, such as the revocation of a security clearance. It would also authorize the Office of Special Counsel to obtain judicial review of board decisions. Furthermore, it would allow for review to be filed in a court of appeals. If it were found that a whistleblower was discriminated against, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act would include compensatory damages among the list of corrective actions. Additionally, the board would be authorized to impose disciplinary actions and civil penalties against the discriminating body. The Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act is necessary to complete what Congress started in 1912, to protect a clear, safe channel of communications for citizens to seek to protect all of us. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Um, any other member wish to seek recognition? If not, uh, I'll, do, uh, I'll do it after. I'll do pass the substitute. There is no further discussion. The questions on the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Platts. All in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed say no. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Um, Mr. Platts, I uh, understand we have a colloquy. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. The recognized. Uh, again, I appreciate uh, all of your efforts to forge a workable bill that can be moved through the House quickly. Uh, this effort has resulted in the, in the bill now before us uh, that seeks to clarify Congress's intent regarding whistleblower cases uh, before the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, I had, had hoped to include uh, a provision that would extend a review of Merit System Protection Board whistleblower decisions to all Federal circuits. Uh, which might have resulted in other circuits reaching results that are more in line with the intent of Congress than uh, the uh, Federal Circuit has shown in, in the last decade. Uh, foregoing this provision, however, clears the way for the bill to move to the floor quickly, avoiding potential claims of jurisdiction by the House Judiciary Committee that would further delay action on this important measure. Uh, nev nevertheless, it is my hope that if the bill becomes law, we will carefully watch the Federal Circuit and see if it follows Congress's clear direction for ruling in whistleblower cases. If it fails to do so, I would uh, appreciate the efforts that we revisit uh, this issue and extend review to all Federal Circuit courts. Well, I thank the gentleman. Um, as I frequently said, the legislative process uh, is an iterative one uh, where we see what works and we come back uh, during a future Congress and address the shortcomings uh, with a clear record before us. And I think, uh, Mr. Platts, you have laid out the, the, the problems right now. Uh, with the appeals going to the uh, Federal Circuit that we've had. The Federal Circuit needs to take note of Congress's intention in this area and follow the law. Uh, you have my commitment to look at all circuits' review if the uh, changes made by the bill prove to be insufficient to restrain the deliberations of the Federal Circuit. I thank the gentleman. 
Um, I would move that the Committee on Government Reform report H.R. 3281 is amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 3281 to the House. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed say no. And can the chair of the ayes have it? The motion is agreed to. H.R. 3281, the Federal Employee Protection of Disclosure Act, is ordered reported uh, as amended to the House. I move, pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 22, that the Committee authorize the Chairman to offer such motions as may be necessary in the House to go to conference with the Senate on H.R. 3281 or a similar Senate bill without objection. So ordered, and I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make technical and conforming corrections without objection. So uh, ordered. The Committee will now consider H.R. 10, the 9-11 Recommendations Implementation Act. We come together today a little more than three years removed from the worst terrorist attacks in United States history. A coordinated plot that transformed our commercial airliners into missiles, exposed holes in our nation's defenses, and left nearly 3,000 innocent people dead. The September 11th attacks spurred the federal government's largest reorganization in a half century, the creation of the Homeland Security Department to better harness the government's resources to protect Americans from international and domestic threats. H.R. 10, the 9-11 Recommendations Implementation Act, seeks to re restructure the nation's intelligence community in a similar way, improving our intelligence gathering and intelligence sharing operations and making other improvements to continue to make America safer and stronger. This legislation is the culmination of the recommendations contained in the final report of the bipartisan 9-11 Commission and the oversight work Congress, and in many cases this committee, um, has done in recent years on subjects like information sharing, security clearances, law enforcement revitalization, and government reorganization. This legislation is comprehensive, deliberative, and effective. We've taken the best work of the 9-11 Commission and of Congress itself, relying on the expertise found in the committees of jurisdiction to write a better bill. We took our time to craft legislation that creates a nimble, effective, and flat structure for the new National Intelligence Director and the National Counterterrorism Center gives the new director appropriate budget authority, authorizes the president to recommend future intelligence reorganizations, harmonizes our security clearance operations, streamlines the presidential appointment process for intelligence jobs, revitalizes the FBI, and establishes new standards for identification cards and birth certificates. At all times, this legislation remains true to the findings and recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. Is it more specific, more fleshed out than the report? Of course, it needs to be. The Commission's report was too compelling uh, to read uh, to ever be confused with legislation. It's been said that you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. The same can be said of our efforts to transform the Commission's language into legislation that works, that conforms with other laws, and that gets the job done. I'm proud of what we've achieved in this legislation on behalf of the American people, who understandably are clamoring for change. It accomplishes the goal of revamping our intelligence networks and makes other changes necessary to protect our national security. Let me just point out a few of the provisions of the larger bill that fall within our jurisdiction of government reform and why we believe they're crucial to this effort. Executive Reorganization Authority for Intelligence Agencies. H.R. 10 gives the President the power to submit reorganization plans limited to the intelligence community to Congress for a guaranteed up or down vote. We can't afford to assume this legislation is a panacea that will somehow be the last word on intelligence reform. The President should have the ability to make further tweaks to the organization without having to worry about his proposal getting watered down or blocked in Congress uh, by jurisdictional fights between committees. Secondly, a streamlined financial disclosure for those nominated to positions within the intelligence community. Just about anyone who studies the presidential appointments process realize that it's broken. It takes too long to confirm individuals to key positions, and the process itself often drives away some of the best qualified people to serve. Financial disclosure requirements are supposed to protect against conflict of interest concerns, but they've become proxy statements for a nominee's net worth with more detail than necessary. This legislation returns to the original intent of financial disclosures and improves security clearance process. The legislation would assign security clearance policy and standards guidance to the Office of National Intelligence Director and require reciprocity among agencies. That is critical because we right now face a national backlog of 500,000 security clearances uh, that we need that we don't have. That means the government is paying more for people in these areas uh, than is necessary, and it means that we don't have people on the job 
ready to do things that need to be done to protect the homeland. This would enable an individual with a top secret clearance at, say, Treasury to retain that clearance sh should he or she move to another agency. Efforts at enforcing reciprocity have failed before, but it needs to be honored uh, to put an end to the time and money-wasting practice of agencies doing their own investigations and their own adjudications. This drives up the cost of doing business, and this cost ultimately is passed on to the taxpayers. New federal standards for identification cards and birth certificates. We need to have confidence that when someone shows a state driver's license to board a plane, to show a state birth certificate to get a passport, that that ID is valid. We need to know that people who say they are is who they are. This legislation provides grant money to help states meet the new federal guidelines and gives them three years to comply. It has the support of state motor vehicle administrators and 9-11 victims' families. A revitalized FBI workforce. H.R. 10 provides for retention bonuses and critical pay authorities to help the FBI improve its intelligence directorate. It also allows for delays in mandatory retirements and the creation of reserve service so the agency can reactivate retired employees with very specialized skills. It has a requirement that agencies uh, enhance their planning for information security needs. This is accomplished through an amendment to Klinger Cohen Act uh, reporting uh, provisions, adding information security to the list of uh, items agencies must consider in systems planning and acquisition. In a nutshell, that's a summary of our committee's contribution to this legislation. It's a contribution that helps accomplish the goal of not simply repackaging what we have now or not simply creating another layer of bureaucracy, of aligning authority with responsibility to make sure information is reaching uh, the people it needs to reach. Let me conclude by saying that I know there's going to be some hard-hitting debate here today. That's to be expected uh, this close to an election and this political climate with people of goodwill with different ideas over how to best get the job done. I'm heartened by the knowledge that this committee has acted in a bipartisan fashion as this legislation has been drafted and that even in the areas where there's disagreement, co uh, college collegiality and an honest exchange of opinions have prevailed. Uh, I might add, uh, Mr. Waxman, that on so many things, uh, we, even where we have disagreed, we've been able to sit down in a collegial manner and, uh, and have honest discussions, and uh, I have the utmost respect uh, for the ideas that are coming from you and your side on these issues, and uh, hope we look forward to a healthy discussion of them. I want to now recognize the distinguished uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Before I do that, let me just note that I think about 1.30 today, there is a bill uh, that takes away the District of Columbia's uh, gun, handgun ban on the floor. I think you and I both want to be present uh, in opposition to that legislation. So we will recess uh, for that uh, time period so we can go with other members who might want to go over and address uh, that issue if we aren't completed at that time, if, if that understanding is uh, okay with you. And yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Mr. Chairman. Other members of the committee, uh, I think, will also want to be on the floor to discuss that uh, piece of legislation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to proceed uh, with my opening statement because what we're doing in this committee is taking up legislation of enormous importance how to make our nation safe from future terrorist attacks. Last month, we heard from two of the members of the 9-11 Commission, former Navy Secretary John Lehman and former Senator Bob Kerry, and something that Senator Kerry said then has stuck with me. He said that as horrific as the 9-11 attacks were, some good had come out of them. They awoke our nation to the uh, terrorism threats we face, and they united the nation in a common purpose. The work of the 9-11 Commission embodies that sense of unity. Against the odds, they produced a unanimous, bipartisan set of recommendations about how to make our nation safer. The work in the Senate has been bipartisan. Senator Lieberman has worked with both Senator Collins and Senator McCain to produce bipartisan legislation embodying the work of the 9-11 commissioners. The question is, can we do the same here? Some members are clearly trying to cross the aisle to forge a bipartisan consensus about how to combat terrorism and make our nation safer. In particular, Representative Car uh, Carolyn Maloney and Chris Shays have introduced legislation that follows carefully the crafted Senate approach, and I wish our starting point was the bill that they put together. Instead, we are considering H.R. 10, 
legislation drafted by the Republican leadership, not in true bipartisan fashion. This is the bill that we were handed, produced by the Republican leadership. And we were told we should process in our committee those parts of the bill that are within our jurisdiction, but other parts we couldn't even deal with. As introduced, H.R. 10 is deeply flawed. Today, uh, Representative Jim Turner, the ranking member of the Homeland Security Commission, uh, released a document that compared H.R. 10 to the 9-11 Commission recommendations and the Senate legislation. And I'd like to introduce this comparison into the record today. This is a report card on H.R. 10, GOP, GOP bill fails to implement most 9-11 Commission recommendations. In addition, there was a uh, document produced by uh, uh, the Democratic Leader's Office that also reviews RH H.R. 10, and if Mr. Chairman, without objection, I'd like to put those two uh, documents. Without objection, those documents will be put in the record. There are 41 recommendations that the 9-11 Commission report suggested for us to adopt legislatively. Mr. Turner's analysis finds that H.R. 10 fully implements 11 of these recommendations. In contrast, 16 rep recommendations are not addressed at all, and 14 are only partially implemented. The missing components are not minor oversights. H.R. 10 does not give the National Intelligence Director the full authority recommended by the 9-11 Commission. It does not take the actions recommended by the Commission to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It falls short on border security, aviation security, and emergency response. And at the same time, H.R. 10 includes controversial poison pills, like the new provisions that expand the Patriot Act and strip away rights from foreign nationals. At our hearing in August, former Secretary Lehman said that the 9-11 Commission recommendations are not a Chinese menu. We can't just pick and choose from the recommendations without destroying the fabric that binds them together. Yet that is exactly what H.R. 10 does. Today, I hope we can, on a bipartisan basis, begin to correct some of the flaws in H.R. 10 and produce a better piece of legislation. We can't make a complete fix. In fact, because our jurisdiction is limited, we can't address the more, most important flaws in the legislation, but I hope we can make a start. We will have our work cut out for us. Limited as our jurisdiction is, there are many problems that we need to fix. This bill does not implement the information sharing provisions recommended by the 9-11 Commission. It does not implement the security clearance recommendations. It fails to set up the Civil Liberties Board, and it lacks key accountability provisions, such as an Inspector General. At the same time, it includes damaging extraneous provisions, such as the one that undermines longstanding financial disclosure requirements. Incredibly, this bill no longer requires intelligence appointees to disclose whether they have assets worth over $50 million. In fact, they're not required to disclose assets over $25 million or even f over $5 million. In, in fact, this, what this bill says is if you have assets over, I think it's two or two and a half million dollars, that's all you have to say. If your assets are $50 million, we won't know about it. All you'll disclose is the two and a half million dollar asset figure. Now, where did that come from? There was no 9-11 Commission recommendation supporting this kind of financial obfuscation. It's just simply an opportunity to use this 9-11 Commission bill as something uh, to be a vehicle so that very, very wealthy people won't have to disclose how much wealth they have and in, a, in a potential conflict of interest. Well, my hope is that we can put our differences aside today and work to fix these problems. A helpful step has already occurred. H.R. 10 included extraneous provisions that could have stripped collective bargaining rights from employees at the Department of Homeland Security. 
uh, Lord knows that that bill on Homeland Security took away a lot of the bargaining rights for those employees, as this committee has also recommended and put into law at the Defense Department. The chairman has agreed to stop uh, these provisions from being put into the bill, and I commend him for that. As we work through the amendment process, I hope we can continue to improve the bill today. It may be an arduous process, but if we all put partisanship aside and ask what will truly make our nation safer, I think we can succeed. I think we must succeed because the stakes could not be higher. I know that there are families, family members of 9-11 victims who are watching what we do. I want you to know that I sympathize with the loss you have suffered, and I'm committed to working with you, the 9-11 commissioners, and my colleagues to enact legislation that is worthy of the sacrifice that your loved ones have made. Congress set up a 9-11 commission to look at what happened and to help us make changes so that this sort of thing will never happen again. After setting up that commission and getting their recommendations, I think H.R. 10 is not worthy of that commission that Congress voted for and is not meeting the recommendations that they set before us. I hope we can change, starting in this committee and later on the <coughs> House floor, to meet, up, uh, meet uh, our, our, uh, our responsibilities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waxman. I'm going to hold the record open until the end of the day for members who would like to submit written statements. And we're going to now open the bill for consideration. Uh, without objection, H.R. 10 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The amendment has been distributed to members. And without objection, the amendment will be considered read and original text for purposes of amendment. Before I begin recognizing members to offer amendments, I want to explain the procedures that we're going to follow today. As you know, H.R. 10 is a comprehensive approach to intelligence and security reform. Uh, the bill contains many provisions in other committees' uh, jurisdictions, and it was referred to 13 different uh, committees. For this process to work, uh, and, and some of these are controversial areas that are unfortunately not within this committee's jurisdiction, and I may in fact agree with you on uh, Mr. Waxman, but that we're not going to be able to affect uh, today. But for this process to work, each committee must respect the jurisdiction of every other committee. It's my understanding that the Rules Committee and the House leadership will not consider any provisions that would lead to a sequential referral. For this reason, I'll honor the terms of H.R. 10's referral to this committee and will strictly but fairly enforce House Rule 10 regarding committee jurisdiction. Amendments that are not in this committee's jurisdiction are going to be ruled out of order. I understand that some of you will be frustrated by this procedure. We're frustrated by this procedure. But it's my intention to allow members to discuss their amendments, that, even if they aren't in order, before enforcing those points of order. to allow you to, to make your points, and hopefully, if we can't make them here, you'll be able to make them on the House floor. I'll ask each of you to understand why it's necessary to follow this procedure and help me protect this committee's place at the table when this bill goes to the floor. Are there any amendments? Ms. Watson. Uh, My, my amendment is base text. Like Ms. Watson, would you yield back to me for just a second? Let me, I'm going to go with Mr. Waxman and I'll uh, start over. The, Mr. Ruppersberger, we're going to recognize you first. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk regarding security clearances. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Ruppersberger to. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that we dispense with the reading of the amendment. Without objection. No, the nine, the gentleman's the, recognized for five minutes. The 9-11 Commission made a speci <coughs> specific recommendations about security clearances. On page 422 of the report, the Commission recommended the following. A single federal agency should be responsible for providing and maintaining security clearances, ensuring uniform standards, including uniform security questionnaires and financial reporting requirements, and maintaining a single database. The current system has many problems with backlogs in granting security clearances. As we have discussed in the National Security Subcommittee with Chairman Shays, and as I have dealt with in my role on the Intelligence Committee, the Commission's recommendation is designed to solve these problems by centralizing and simplifying the security clearance process. Now, unfortunately, H.R. 10 doesn't fully implement this recommendation. It doesn't select a single agency to carry out the, fu the function. Instead, the bill would allow numerous agencies to continue conducting their own security clearance investigations with a new deputy providing guidance 
acting as sort of a clearinghouse for the information. Rather than simplifying the process, I believe that H.R. 10 has the potential to create an additional level of bureaucracy. My amendment would replace these provisions with language that is closer to the Commission's original intent. My amendment empowers a single agency to conduct all security clearance investigations, but it doesn't mandate which agency this should be. Instead, it provides the President flexibility to make this determination. In addition, my amendment would leave security clearance adjudications with the individual agencies so they can take into account their own particular requirements. I just want to point out that my amendment comes directly from Section 115 of Senate Bill 2845, which is the bipartisan Collins-Lieberman bill that is well on its way to full passage in the Senate. Finally, this is the same language that is in the bipartisan House counterpart, H.R. 5150, which was introduced by our own colleagues here on the Government Reform Committee, uh, Ms. Maloney and, of course, Chairman Shays. I've said throughout this process that I think it is critically important that the 9-11 Commission and their incredible work be the model all of us in Congress must use in moving forward with this legislation. I urge all of my colleagues to support this amendment and bring the security clearance language in H.R. 10 back to the Commission's original recommendations. I, uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, and I know he's given this a lot of thought. In fact, this language is in the, uh, the uh, Senate uh, bill. Um, we've looked at this. I don't think I can support it. Yesterday, the administration said that they opposed this provision, uh, purporting to require the President to select a single department or agency to conduct all security clearance investigations. It says this provision would impermissibly interfere with the President's need for flexibility in conducting security clearance investigations and does not recognize the need of individual intelligence um, agencies. Uh, and for that reason, uh, since we're asking them to do this, they, they don't, they're not comfortable with this. My questions are, if, if one agency were to do all the investigations, who's going to referee what, re what uh, clearances receive priority? Undoubtedly, you'd have DOD, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, the CIA, all clamoring and claiming that their needs for clearances were not being met or that someone has always favored one over the other. By allowing agencies the flexibility to conduct their own investigations, then their priorities can be dealt with within those agencies as they see fit. Our language provides for metrics, for uniform standards, for investigative agencies to measure the speed of the investigative process. Each agency conducting clearances, whether it's the investigative or adjudicative phase, has standard processes and timeframes for completion. Reciprocity is dealt with through the codification of existing executive orders and the prohibition of agencies uh, from adding additional requirements for security clearances, which is often the loophole used in the existing system. Maintaining multiple federal investigative agencies allows the government to maintain its competitive edge when negotiating contracts with the private sector for additional investigative capability. No agency that deals with security clearances favors this consolidation. The contractor community doesn't favor it, and the administration uh, doesn't favor it. And I think uh, for the reasons mentioned, we have additional flexibility built in here. I think under the language that we have put together, uh, you're going to see, uh, uh, and, and the reciprocity language in particular, in allowing the, uh, in the NID to the, the National uh, in, in, in Intelligence Director uh, to kind of ride herd over all this. We bring additional flexibility to the security uh, clearing process and, uh, uh, frankly, uh, allow a, have a better um, conclusion than we get with this. So I'm going to oppose the amendment. Anyone else wish to speak on uh, Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I respectfully uh, disagree with some of the comments that you made and want to agree with my colleague, Mr. Ruthensberger. There is no reason why a single agency couldn't conduct uh, all of the clearances on this if it's properly staffed and properly managed. And in fact, the 9-11 Commission has made the determination after an extensive review, uh, review of documents and witnesses, that the current system, in fact, isn't working. Uh, and that's why we need change. It's important uh, that we take the good work of the 9-11 Commission and their recommendations and follow them to the extent that's possible especially where they've documented extensive problems with the current system, and especially where there already is bipartisan support in the Senate and bipartisan support here in the House. The current bill, the way it's constructed, H.R. 10, doesn't do that. It makes some of the improvements. It sets common standards, but it misses the main point, and that is simply that a single agency in charge of conducting all background check investigations would be an improvement. 
I know the President uh, feels that his flexibility might be interfered with, but frankly, I think that's a misreading of the amendment. The language clearly gives him the flexibility to decide which agency should do it, and again, if it's properly staffed and properly managed and properly funded, then it should not uh, affect his flexibility. All of the colleagues here should know that we should go with this amendment language. It's the language that's in Collins-Lieberman. It's the language that's in the Commissioner's report. It's the language that was introduced by Chairman Shays in the House. It's the language supported by the 9-11 families in the caucus, which is chaired by our colleagues Chairman Shays and Representative Maloney. Let's adopt it. Let's move forward. Not, let's not let something like this be a stumbling block. I yield back. Thank you. Any other members that wish to be recognized? Mr. Ruppersberger. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first thing, I understand your concern. I think, oh, your time, uh, this is your member, your time has been there. Uh, I'll recognize Mr. Waxman, who can yield to you. Yield to me. Okay. Well, Mr. Watson wanted to be recognized. Well, okay, Ms. Watson, I'll recognize. Okay, uh, Ms. Watson will yield to, I, I was recognized. Would you yield to Mr. Ruppersberger and give him time? I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Um, first, Mr. Chairman, I understand your concerns and ask that we really work together on this issue. We know we have a serious backlog. We have to, to fix this issue as it relates to security clearances. Uh, I, I think there's a distinction that could be made versus the issue of investigating versus granting. Each agency, the CIA, NSA, all the agencies will have a say on the granting but we're talking about moving the backlog and, and about the investigations so that we can have one person who can referee and coordinate to make sure that we don't create a level of bureaucracy and we can move quickly with these security clearances because it's a major issue that we have to deal with if we're going to go forward with respect to protecting our national security. Will the gentleman yield, yield? The gentleman yield to me? I yield back. Uh, back to the gentlelady who I, I asked her to yield to me. Okay, Waxman. thanks. Uh, so, so the commission looked at this issue. And we had FBI and CIA and all these different agencies not sharing information with each other. And therefore, even though the FBI seemed to have some information about uh, potential terrorists taking lessons in airplane flying, they never were able to communicate it. And CIA didn't know what FBI was doing. FBI didn't know what CIA was doing. So the big problem they saw was information sharing. And one of the problems in lack of sharing information is that each agency has its own security clearance. So if you have information from the CIA, they may say, well, the FBI clearance isn't the same as the CIA clearance, and we're not going to give that information to the other people. Plus, there are people waiting for their security clearances to be processed. So the 9-11 Commission made a, a reasonable recommendation that there be some central agencies that just break this backlog of security clearances and make sure that a security clearance is, uh, at, at the CIA is good for the FBI and good for the DIA and everyone else involved. That's why they made the recommendation they did, and that's what the Ruppersberger Amendment would uh, accomplish. But what we're getting from the Republican side is the administration doesn't want this. And I don't understand why they don't want it. Maybe because they're representing all the different conflicting agencies that don't want to share the information or think they ought to be the ones in control. But this amendment makes such sense, and that's why the Commission recommended it unanimously. So I would hope that the members would uh, adopt the Ruppersburg and 9-11 Commission uh, recommendation and uh, yield back the, the time. Let me just uh, say uh, to my friend, my concern, just looking at the language of the amendments, is not later than 45 days after the date the President shall select a single department or agency to conduct all security clearance investigations. They're not asking to oversee it. They're not asking to coordinate with other agencies. They're asking this one department to conduct all of them. That, that's ridiculous. Right now, you are remaking, you're making the situation worse at this point. Right now, you have a lot of different agencies that can, that can set their own priorities within their agency. And what we do under our legislation is we allow the Na National Intelligence Director, the NID, to basically referee and oversee this and can set uh, priorities, but being able to use the resources of all of those different agencies to get through the backlog, whether it's through contractors or uh, whether it's through using those agencies. This can, puts it into one, and I just think it's, it's not flexible enough. And it's for that reason uh, that I would respectfully uh, disagree on this and ask for a, a no vote. Uh, are there any other members who wish to be heard on this uh, issue? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, gentleman from Florida. Um, 
Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, having uh, chaired uh, civil service uh, for four years and looked at the process of trying to clear people even in routine jobs, uh, bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Uh, we have a tendency of uh, throwing all these things together. I think at first blush, the commission, when they looked at this, uh, said uh, someone needs to be in charge and do this uh, uh, in, in a consolidated fashion. But if you look at uh, consolidating it, what you're going to do is consolidate the backlog. Uh, there's more of an issue of process, someone being in charge, setting the standards, and then uh, developing the, the process. And as the chair, chairman has said, also uh, some of this will probably have to be contracted out. You're talking about massive numbers if you're going to combine all of these uh, agencies. So it sounds like a simple uh, consolidation but what you do is you end up with a uh, you'll end up with a, a much more severe backlog so someone needs to be in charge and that's what the administration uh, bill does and then the the processing of these uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, of applicants needs to be done in an orderly fashion and coordination of that effort so that's what needs to be done if you think is uh, if you think bigger, consolidated is uh, going to be better, um, I think you're wrong. Uh, I think this approach that uh, is well thought out uh, by the chair and those who've, who've taken a serious look at that, I urge a defeat of that uh, uh, amendment uh, on that basis. Thank you, Mr. Will chairman. the gentleman from Florida yield to me uh, on that? Gentlemen, we Mr. have chairman, some time. I, I would love to yield to you, but at this point, exact moment, the provisions that I've uh, worked hard on uh, next door in the Transportation Committee dealing with aviation uh, security are being considered, and I must present immediately uh, those recommendations for that bill. But otherwise, Mr. Waxman, I'd love to chat with you some other time. Thank you. Well, you're certainly very kind. The gentleman from California is recognized. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, maybe the gentleman from Florida will stick around and hear what I have to say. He says that the administration has somebody in charge. Well, the administration doesn't have somebody in charge. The administration lets every agency handle its own security clearances. What the commission recommended was a single federal agency should be responsible for providing and maintaining security clearances, ensuring uniform standards, including uniform security questionnaires and financial reporting requirements, and maintaining a single database. That seems to me to simplify it cut through the bureaucracy. What the uh, bill provides is m more bureaucracy. Every agency duplicates the work that's being done by the others. That's why we have this backlog. That's why we have this problem. People don't get their security clearances, and therefore they can't talk to each other about dangers. Well, the that, and so that seems to me, uh, I know the gentleman made these statements, and I suppose he was sincere, but I must tell him he's wrong in his statement if he thinks that there's somebody in charge there is a single agency that you can appeal to, but I don't know how you appeal if you're waiting for your security clearance and you haven't got it. If you're denied a security clearance, maybe you can appeal to it, but then you've got an appeal on top of all the things you're doing at the different agencies. So I just want to point out to the gentleman uh, who didn't stick around, I suppose, but to hear this, but his statement was incorrect, therefore his reasoning was based on incorrect information and uh, I, uh, I think, uh, uh, therefore, the arguments ought not to be uh, persuasive. Will the gentleman yield Certainly. for just a second? I mean, my perspective's a little different on this because we're not, we do allow the National Intelligence Director, the NID, to be responsible for, for uh, maintaining it. We, we say that the Deputy National Intelligence Director uh, for Community Management and Resources has the responsibility for directing the oversight of investigations, developing uniform standards, serving as the final authority to designate an authorized investigative agency, ensuring reciprocal recognition. The problem with the gentleman's amendment, as I read it, is that in this case you set up a one department to conduct all security clearances. They're not just overseeing it and maintaining it, they are conducting it. And right now we have, uh, it, we admit this, the situation's broke. I think there is that realization from your side, Mr. Waxman, from our side, from the 9-11 Commission. Uh, the question is how do you best um, uh, take care of this? And in, in our judgment, you let the National Intelligence Director 
uh, basically ride herd on everybody, but you don't abolish those agencies that are doing it now. You allow them the flexibility to do that under direction from, from the NID as opposed to saying, well, you, Defense Department, Energy Department, CIA, you can't do your own. We're going to put all of the investigations under one department. And I'm just concerned it's, that, that it doesn't work. That, that's well, my concern. Mr. Davis, the gentleman uh, Mr. Yield? I still have the time. I just want to point out that uh, we disagree on this issue. I, I respect your, the views you just expressed, and I, I, I've seen what the Commission recommended, and I accept their point of view. But I think it's important for us to air these differences in a respectful way not act like we're being uh, patronizing to each other and, act and say that it's something we ought to chat about. I mean, we are talking about a terrorist attack that can kill uh, thousands and thousands of people and to say that we're going to chat about this. Yeah. Uh, the 9-11 Commission made its recommendations. We, I would like people to support it in this regard. If there's a dis difference of opinion, there's a difference of opinion. I can accept that. Perhaps we can continue well, the gentleman looking yield? at it. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I, I uh, speak strongly in support of Mr. Rupert Sperger's amendment. Uh, his amendment uh, is exactly the same language that is in the Collins-Lieberman Senate mark uh, uh, that was passed out of the committee, and it is also the exact same language that is in the House mark that uh, Congressman Shays and I put forward. Uh, we have uh, family members that our 9-11 family members here in the audience today, and they are supporting the Rupersburg Amendment, as well as the bipartisan members of the 9-11 Commission. Um, I, I feel uh, very strongly about this. Um, the city that I represent has been attacked. It is constantly under threat of future attack, and I deeply believe that we should endorse and pass all of the recommendations that the Commission worked two years, it's been three years since the attack, to come forward. And one of them was this particular one that would place all of this security clearance in one agency. And I feel we should follow the leadership of the 9-11 Commission that worked so hard on it, the 9-11 families, uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the McCain, uh, Lieberman, Collins bill, and the language that Mr. Rupersberg put forward is the exact same language that is in the Shays-Maloney bill before the House, which we hope to get an up or down vote. So I, I yield back to the uh, ranking member. I, I thank the chairman for his uh, vigilant work in so many areas, but I respectfully disagree and feel that on this particular amendment, we should be supportive to the commission uh, guidance. Thank you very much. I yield back to Mr. Waxman. No, to Mr. Rupersberg. Do you have a oh, time's, time's gone. Time is well. Are there other members that seek Tom, a recognition Tom, Tom. on this issue? Yeah, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chase. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be an interesting day, and I, I am, um, I think sometimes we're going to be debating fine points, and we're going to obviously both be able to make very uh, cogent arguments for our, our position. In in the chair, I, in, uh, in the committee I chair, the National Security Subcommittee. We've had a number of hearings on the backlog on security, and I, and I believe it's really almost a national disgrace. It has occurred for so long. We have had people that even work in private companies like Pratt Whitney, where the worker has been hired by Pratt Whitney to work on something that he needs clearance on, or she, and for six months they are basically in the company not doing anything. Uh, awesome uh, a waste of resources. I wrestle with why we would want to have various departments have their own bureaucracy when in the end the clearance requirements seem pretty basic to me. And you need to be cleared in one agency, you need to be cleared in another, you need to meet the same basic standard. So I don't know why we would even want to burden the uh, head of the intelligence or his people with having to coordinate among different standards and rules when it just seems to me we need one standard. And, and so I do think this amendment makes sense, and I do think it is in keeping with what the Commission has recommended. And my view during the course of the day is to try to limit the number of areas that we're going to have disagreement with the House and the Senate so that we're not creating a bill in conference, that there are going to be certain points that we can agree on whether we're Republicans or Democrats, in the Senate or in the House. And this is one that I think the Senate uh, 
process and the commission process make sense. And I'll also say that the president has basically come out in support of the proposal of Collins Lieberman. So where we can be consistent in our own jurisdiction, it would seem logical that we should do that. Will the gentleman yield? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> on this particular provision, the administration says in their statement, on their, on their what's called their SAP statement, their statement of administration policy, the administration opposes the provision in the committee bill purporting to require the president to select a single department or agency to conduct all security clearance investigations. My concern about this amendment is you're having one agency do it all. You're not saying that they're going to oversee it, that they're going to give direction. It says they're going to conduct all security clearance investigations. I think, first of all, you lose a lot of resources when you do that with some of the people that are doing this in DOD, in OPM, uh, in, in the uh, FBI, and in other departments that, that uh, we want to keep those people working. It just needs to be coordinated better. You have to have reciprocity. And we thought the National Intelligence Director uh, ought to have the flexibility then to move things around, but have that. The differences here are very slight. There is a great agreement among all of us that this is a problem that is broken and needs fixing. As the gentleman, as both of my friends have said, this is a national embarrassment. I'm afraid putting it into one bureaucracy uh, it doesn't make, doesn't solve the problem. And you lose flexibility, and so does the administration uh, on this. And I don't agree with the administration on, on everything uh, by any means. But in this particular case, we're asking them to carry it out. We're asking them to implement this, and I think they, their views on this should be given great weight. Also, the contractor community, which I'm very well acquainted with uh, out in Northern Virginia, uh, is uh, in the, what they've told us. The people that are doing this doesn't feel it works as well this way. This is not a, a major difference. I think we've all identified uh, the, the problems, and I respect uh, 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 everyone's opinion. I hope that we do have some differences, so when we get to conference, we can roll up our sleeves and maybe uh, uh, try to resolve those differences at this could point. I, could I claim my But time for that reason, I'm, I'm going to oppose the amendment. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, we're going to have plenty of, of, of disagreements on plenty of issues without having to add issues like this to the list. And, and my concern is the exact same as yours, but I come to a different conclusion. My concern is why have so many different government agencies with so many different standards when in the end we want to know if they have a secure background? And it just seems to me you will cut down costs, you'll speed up the process, you'll have less bureaucracy, you'll have less administration, you'll have more people at the tip of the spear doing the clearances that we need. And, and that's why I support it. And I thank the gentleman. I'm going to yield for just uh, 30 Absolutely. seconds. Uh, what we do create is one standard. We don't have eight different agencies with different – we create one standard. What we don't do is throw the baby out with the bathwater. The people in DOD or the people in the Department of Energy and the people in CIA that have been doing these clearances for decades, we don't say to them, you're moving out of those agencies, we're going to consolidate you in a new agency. They can continue doing that, but they now move under the direction of the NID. And I think it, you know, it, we just have a difference of opinion on this. I think the committee needs to vote up or down. I respect the gentleman's opinion. Mr. Chairman, yes. Chairman Member, uh, yeah, nice. yeah, gentleman from Maryland. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's not a syllable that Mr. Shays just spoke that I disagree with. You talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It sounds like what we're doing by not adopting this amendment is creating problems that could lead to a baby being thrown out. It just seems to make sense. Everybody in this country have a photographic memory embedded in the DNA of every cell of their brains of 9-11 and what happened on that day. We're trying, just because it's been done one way in the past, does not mean you continue that way. We all have come to the point where we realize that we need to look at our whole security situation in this country so that a 9-11 does not happen again. And it just seems to make sense to me. And um, I just, I, I'm very uh, concerned if this is the pattern that we're going to be going on today, it seems as if we would be trying to expedite matters so that we can get this thing through so that the American people will be in a better position to be protected. With that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would yield to my good friend uh, from Maryland, Mr. Rufus Berger. General's recognized. Thank you for yielding. Uh, just in response, Mr. Chairman, to, to the issue of uh, the flexibility. Uh, to begin with, I'm very surprised that the White House has taken the, the position. Pardon? You can't hear? Oh, mic? Yeah. <coughs> Closer to the mic. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that the White House has taken this position. 
because in the amendment it states the president shall select a single department agency or element of the executive branch to conduct all security clearance investigations of employees and contractor personnel of the United States government. So the president clearly has the authority, the power, and the flexibility. Uh, the other issue is reciprocity. In the amendment, it deals with the issue of, of reciprocity, that all the different agencies can work together. But I think one of the hang-ups that, that we seem to have here is that we're talking about the investigations. We're not talking about granting. Each, in this, in this amendment, each agency, CIA, NSA, whatever that may be, will have the final authority as far as granting is concerned, if, if they're concerned about security. We have a serious problem. The Commission said, and I, and I will quote again from the Commission's report, a single federal agency should be responsible for, for providing and maintaining security clearances, ensuring uniform standards, including uniform security questionnaires and financial reporting requirements, and maintaining yeah, a single yeah, database. Yeah. We need to fix this problem now. This amendment does that. It gives the president the power and flexibility to do whatever they need to do. But the yeah. present system isn't working no, now, no, and if we don't pass this amendment, in my opinion, we will not be able to fix the problem of this backlog as it relates to security clearances. Well, well the gentleman yield for just yield, for yield. Uh, let me just say to my friend, we both recognize the problem, we both fix the problem, or purport to fix it. We just, the, the, the difference is very slight. You put the conducting of all these in one agencies, we put the oversight to the NID, but we both have uniform standards, we both have reciprocity. I mean, th there, there are two different fixes here that we think both address it. We think Ours also addresses the 9-11 Commission concerns. What we don't say is one agency has to conduct all of them. They, we allow the NID to set the standards, make reciprocity happen, but would continue the personnel that do this in the different agencies be able to direct them to do it instead of taking them out of the agencies and moving them under one. That, that's, that's the difference. And I, I respect the gentleman's view on that, and I understand how it came about, and uh, we just have a difference of opinion. But I think they're both fixes in good faith, and, and uh, from our perspective, we're ready to vote. Uh, and I would if anyone else wishes to Reclaiming address. my time. Do I still have time? Yes, you do. Reclaiming my time. Mr. Chairman, you just gave an eloquent uh, sound like you're on our side on this one. Uh, and and uh, I would urge the chairman to vote with us. <laughs> I yield back. We're all on the same side at the end of the day. We just have different views. Okay. Are there other members seeking recognition on this? Vote. Okay. If not, um, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Ruppersberger. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Aye. Chairman, uh, and pin the chair, the noes have it. Uh, I'm sure you'd like a roll call on that, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton passes. Ms. Ross Layton. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Souter. Mr. La Tourette. Mr. Osi. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Cannon, Mr. Schrock, Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan, Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal votes no. Mrs. Miller, Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy, where is he? Oh, Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Turner, Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. T. Berry. Mr. T. Berry votes no. Ms. Harris. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Towns. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Sanders. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Rupersberger votes aye. Ms. Norton. Mr. Cooper. 
Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Micah. You are not recorded. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Latourette. Mr. Latourette votes no. Mr. Osi. Mr. Chairman. 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 We, have we have other members. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes no. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Are there others that wish to be recorded? Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Any other members? Uh, Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Any other members uh, wish to vote? Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, I have 1818. Am amendment fails. Are there any members of Mr. Chase? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Let me, Ms. Ms. Harris, did you miss the vote? <laughs> well, you're late, but we'd like to have her recorded how she would have voted had she been here, I think, for the record. Ms. Ross Leighton? Okay. The, the, the votes will not count, but. Well, we just finished the vote, but uh, it was uh, 18. <laughs> Thank you. Let the word reflect they came in, but they're how they would have voted. Uh, Mr. Waxman and I, uh, I think, would like to um, see if we can reach a unanimous consent agreement on rolling the votes on other amendments. Uh, Mr. Waxman, would you like to uh, put a motion? Well, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent uh, after discussing this matter with you that, and while all members are here, that we, uh, on all future amendments where a roll call vote is requested, that we roll them uh, to a time at, to be called by the chair and then vote on all the uh, amendments at one time. And the time will be in consultation with Mr. Waxman. Uh, we're not sure how many amendments we're going to have at this point. It's difficult to fix it. Um, but we will allow, we'll, we'll let members know through the committee process and try to roll the votes at one time. Is there any objection? If not, uh, so ordered. Mr. Shays, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the, the clerk has an amendment. Uh, it's the major substitute. Amendment number one? Yes, amendment number one. Amendment to H.R. 10 offered by Mr. Shays. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following and conform would, the table. The chair would reserve a point of order. Mr. Shays, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the bill before us this morning reflects many of the recommendations adopted by the 9-11 Commission but in too many ways, it is a pale reflection, a blurred and obstructed image tainted by matters extraneous to our true mission here. Ours is a solemn obligation, a debt of honor owed to the dead, their survivors, and the 10 noble citizens who put aside personal lives and partisanship to point the way to a safer future. We owe them nothing less than a respectful, accurate translation of their recommendations into law. The process that produced this bill strayed from that mission, treating an extraordinary historic mandate too much like legislative business as usual. Provisions lacking deference or even reference to the Commission's recommendations, however otherwise meritorious they may be, weigh down the entire enterprise and undermine the effort to render a faithful testament to the Commission's work. In matters committed to the jurisdiction of this committee, Chairman Davis and his staff have worked long and hard to craft language true to the 9-11 Commission report. 
In key areas, they included language from the bipartisan, bicameral bills endorsed by the Commission and 9-11 family members. In others, they built on subcommittee and full committee oversight work to refine and amplify recommendations. Many of the sections before us today merit our support. I wish others had been as careful and thoughtful as our chairman. Inclusion of so many provisions beyond the Commission's call in any final House bill, I think, will distort the House position relative to the Senate, vastly and needlessly increase the risks a conference committee will produce a flawed product or stall altogether. Some of us hope to amend the bill to insert language advanced by Senators Collins and Lieberman, supported by the Commission, by members of both parties in both chambers, and by the President. Regretfully, we understand our amendments are subject to points of order. Ironically, the same narrow, turf-conscious House rules the Commission unequivocally said must change prevent our consideration of the Commission's broader reorganization proposals. In crafting a 9-11 Commission implementation bill, I think we need to be sure to build from ground zero up. The Collins-Lieberman National Intelligence Reform Act of 2004 recognizes the nation's key intelligence agencies, reorganizes our, the nation's key intelligence agencies into a modern structure that is more capable of preventing and acting against global terrorism and other future national security threats. The legislation largely incorporates the key recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, mm -hmm. creates a NID who will manage the country's intelligence community and serves as the President's chief intelligence advisor. This Senate confirmed official, uh, th the Senate confirmed official with strong budget, personnel, security, and other authorities will be able to direct resources where and when they are needed. It creates an, an NCTC expanding the community-wide intelligence analysis capabilities of the new terrorist threat integration center to include developing interagency counterterrorism plans. However, the NT NCTC would not have the authority to direct the execution of operations by agencies and will not be in the military chain of command creates the Civil Liberties Board, as recommended by the 9-11 Commission, to ensure privacy and civil liberties concerns are being protected as the President and executive agencies proposed and implement policies rel uh, related to efforts to protect the, national, the nation against terrorism. And finally, includes provisions that require the establishment of an information sharing network designed to facilitate and promote the sharing of terrorism information throughout the federal government with state and local agencies and where appropriate with the private sector. Basically, uh, we strike out everything after Title I and insert this new language. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone want to else uh, like to be heard? Uh, General Lady from New York. Okay. This morning. Th thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, I, I would like to, strong, uh, to speak strongly in support of the substitute that uh, Mr. Shays has put forward. Uh, we have uh, not only formed a 9-11 Commission caucus that is dedicated to implementing all of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, but we have introduced uh, the House counterpart uh, for the McCain-Lieberman Lieberman Bill 5040, and we have also introduced the House counterpart to Senators Collins and Lieberman's bill. Um, the President has come out in support of the Collins-Lieberman bill. The 9-11 Commission members support it. The 9-11 families support it. And our support will ensure that it will actually pass and get to the President's desk by adding a lot of uh, uh, items that are extraneous to what the 9-11 Commission recommended, even if it is a worthy uh, bill, will only delay uh, the implementation of sending this uh, legislation to the President and will actually mean that the legislation will face uh, a, a uncertain fate. On a, a very personal uh, standpoint, my, my city was attacked, and the Commission has given a blueprint to defend against future attacks. And I want their recommendations to come to this Congress uh, for a vote. I, I would like uh, the, the, uh, uh, to request that the committee allow me to place in the record an analysis that was prepared by uh, Congressman uh, uh, James Turner that shows that 16 
of the, of, the, of the recommendations, of the 141 recommendations, were not implemented at all. 14 are incomplete, and only 11 are implemented. Uh, when we know that the 141 recommendations were all tied to actions that did not take place, that if they had taken place, would have made America safer, uh, I feel yeah. we owe it uh, no, to with, our without constituents. Without objection, that will go in the record. And, 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 the, uh, and the American people to allow a full, unencumbered, clean vote on the uh, Shays Maloney Collin Collins Lieberman uh, bill. And so I, I strongly support it, and I, I believe that, uh, uh, I, and I compliment my, my colleagues, such as Mr. Rupersberger, who have taken language that is clearly germane and put it before this committee and tried to get it into the, the mark before us today. But at the very least, we, we should have an up and down vote. Uh, yesterday, many of us in Congress uh, met with the 9-11 families and the 9-11 uh, commission members. And they are committed to backing a true and clean vote on the commission proposals, and that is what is before us today in, in the Shays Amendment. I support it uh, completely, and I hope that uh, my colleagues will support it and, and work with us to bring it to the floor for a, for, for a clean up or down vote. Anyone else wish to be heard? Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, know you've reserved a point of order on this amendment, and I, I, as I review the rules, uh, you're probably going to rule that it's not in order because the proposal by Mr. Shays and Ms. Maloney be goes beyond the scope of the jurisdiction of this committee, which means that if you make that ruling, as I expect you will, our committee won't be able to vote on it. But other committees are considering the legislation, parts of the legislation, and they too will be denied the opportunity to vote on this amendment. I'd like to ask you whether we would have a commitment from you and, the, and your colleagues on the other side of the aisle to insist that we have an opportunity on the House floor to be able to vote on this matter. You may disagree with us, but we ought to have an opportunity to vote on the 9-11 Commission recommendation intact on the House floor. The, uh, the proposal that's before us is the 9-11 Commission's recommendation that it's supported by that commission. It's the bipartisan bill in the Senate. Now, the reason I ask this question is, just today, we're going to the House floor to vote on a matter of overturning the decision by the duly elected representatives of the District of Columbia, where they wanted a bill to ban certain kinds of assault weapons and police-piercing bullets and other guns as well. That never came through our committee, even though we have jurisdiction. It's been put on the House floor. Uh, members have asked for opportunities to offer amendments to it. The rule that's going to be voted on, I expect will be adopted on a party line vote, will even deny those amendments. So the only opportunity would be on a motion to recommit, which is viewed as a party vote, because if it's a motion to recommit, it usually comes from the uh, Democratic side of the aisle. So my question to you is whether you will support us in insisting on a vote on this Shays Maloney proposal or something like it, and uh, in doing so, join us in voting against a rule that denies us an opportunity to offer this amendment, uh, or someone to offer this amendment on the House floor. Well, let me say to my friend, the way that the bill was, was broken up, I think probably uh, denies any committee the right to vote this up or down. You will get this as a motion to recommit. I'm going to vote against the rule on the D.C. gun ban today. I'm so outraged. But my question is, are you as uh, outraged on, about the 9-11 uh, the, the intelligence bill to vote against the rule if we're not allowed to, allowed to even offer an amendment? Yeah. We shouldn't have to have Mr. Shays offer well, a motion to recommit, which is usually a Democratic motion. No. I, I think it ought to be permitted as an amendment itself. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure I can come to the same conclusion on that, but you will get it as a motion to recommit, and you ought to, 
and that does carry the same weight, as you know, uh, as a uh, as an amendment on the floor, because should the House adopt that, that would then, then become, become the operable bill before the House. So you will get that as a motion to recommit. You will get a straight up vote um, at that point. Well, let me it's, ask you it's this well above my pay grade in terms of uh, telling the Rules Committee to do anything. Is, is yeah, well, let me ask you this question. Um, suppose a rule is crafted, and I have seen this happen, where we are told we can't even offer a substantive motion to recommit, only well, a, I think you ought a to motion be. to recommit. Would you then join us in voting against such a rule? Well, I am a committee chairman, and I don't generally vote against rules. I am today because they have usurped our committee's uh, ju uh, jurisdiction. Um, but I think you will get it as a motion to recommit. I don't see how you would get denied that. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I just, just think our bill is a better bill, though. I am not just – well, you will certainly have an opportunity to vote on your bill as drafted by the Republican leadership. They will put it on the floor, no doubt. But the question is whether those of us, as Democrats and Republicans, that support the 9-11 bipartisan bill will have a chance to vote on it. Well, I would and certainly well, – I mean, I certainly support your having a motion to recommit on this issue. I think that is a, a, a courtesy that I can't see that wouldn't be extended to you. I well, I have seen lots of courtesies denied us, and, and as we are seeing today, where uh, members have been gagged, where, where proposals are not allowed to be offered. Uh, where we can't even vote on it. Uh, if, if people are so strong on the feeling uh, about the merits, they ought to at least put these matters to a vote and, uh, and then try to use arguments, Will the not, gentleman yield? not uh, uh, bludgeon us to uh, not even get a chance Will the, to the offer gentleman it. Yield? Yes, I would be pleased yeah. to yield. The, the, the least of our problems is, is our chairman, who has uh, really, I think, gone out of his way to make sure that um, the issues are debated, and not just in this case, but in so many others. Well, but if I, I can reclaim I, I just, my time, I, know, may I just, may I just, make I just this want point. to reclaim my time because it's about up. I, I wanted to finish my point, if you just allow well, me. Well, yeah, chairman, but I'm I'm finish, uh, unanimous consent, me, extend the gentleman's time just, two minutes. Just very briefly. I just, I just, I'm Mr. Wachtman, but I want to say your basic point is right on target. I will vote against any rule that doesn't give us an opportunity to have an amendment. It shouldn't be a motion to recommit. It should be an amendment that allows, and whether it's an amendment I would offer, you would offer, anyone else, there needs to be an amendment that allows the Commission's uh, position to be voted up or down, and every member needs to, I, well, I, I, think, I appreciate to that. that in reclaiming my time. I appreciate that, Mr. Shays, and I would expect nothing less of you because you are a strong advocate of the bipartisan 9-11 Commission's recommendations. But I would point out that uh, your vote may not make a difference. It is interesting today that two new members were added to our committee. You should be proud that two new Republicans were added uh, to our committee so that they can make sure to uh, vote uh, opposite you and still prevail. Uh, I, uh, I have seen on the floor that uh, we have been denied opportunities, and I wouldn't be surprised if we are denied again the opportunity. I am not using this time just to uh, embarrass the chairman of the committee, but he did make a very telling point. He is a chairman of a committee and does not vote against the leadership. So if it is made into a partisan issue, a bipartisan proposal is destroyed through partisanship, then I think the American people ought to understand that is what is happening. Well, yield back my thank turn. you. And let, me, let me just note, uh, we did add two Republicans today, as you added uh, uh, a, a member uh, a month ago when vacancies occurred. Uh, Mr. Putnam uh, was just named to the Rules Committee under our rules. Uh, when you are on a committee of that level, you leave the other committees. Uh, and so uh, we named um, as a replacement for him today. Mr. Putnam's house was also blown down in the hurricane, and the President's down there today. And we felt it would be appropriate to maintain the current committee ratios. No numbers were switched. Uh, and we're, Dr. Burgess, I recruited him to the committee when Mrs. Davis left uh, to join the Intelligence Committee. So uh, I just I didn't mean that you applied otherwise, but of course we're going to maintain our committee ratios on this, as we would expect you to do and you have done in the past as well. Any other members wish to be heard on this? Uh, 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 Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Recognize Chair. Recognize for five minutes. Mr. Uh, I'm, I'm outraged that we're to be satisfied with a motion to recommit. Will we offer a motion to recommit? The majority goes down to the floor and says, if you want to act on this quickly, if you care passionately about this issue, you will vote against the motion to recommit because the motion to recommit forces this bill to go back through all the committees. And that's going to be the argument that, that we're, we're most likely to hear on the motion uh, to, re to recommit that if we, if we care about national security, if we want to move forward in a quick fashion to protect America, we would have to vote against 
the motion to recommit. I've heard that time and time again on other motions when, when it has been offered on, on, other, on our side of the aisle. And so we will not have a chance to have a second bill heard either as along with other committees as the jurisdiction moves forward or in its entirety. And the bill that is before us, although well-intentioned, I'm sure, by the majority party, did not include members from the other side of the aisle. And we passionately care about national security. And our voice was not heard, and our voice isn't being heard today by not allowing a full vote on the Shays Maloney Amendment. And a motion to recommit is nothing more than window dressing so that the majority can say, well, you know, we tried to work in a bipartisan fashion. Will the gentlelady yield? yield. I yield, I yield my time to the, the, the rest of my time to the gentlewoman from New York. I, I, I would uh, congratulate her on her statement because she pointed out what many of us feel. We want a clean up or down vote on the bill, on the floor, unencumbered with whistles or, 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 or poison pills or even good legislation that, that I support. We deserve a clean vote on the floor, up or down not as a motion to recommit. This is important. This is national security. This is a bipartisan commission that worked for two years on thoughtful recommendations that have been endorsed by the President of the United States and the families and many, many members of Congress. And I, I would hope that our colleagues on this committee will join us in a bipartisan way to get a clean vote on the bill, not as a motion to recommit, a, a clean vote on the floor. It's the least that we can ask for. And, and I yield uh, my time to Mrs. Watson, who it's, also it's wanted to It's not your to time, it's Ms. McCollum's oh, time. Oh, excuse me. I yield. I yield back to Mrs. Uh, McCollum. Mr. Chair, I yield to Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, September 11th is often referred to as our generation's Pearl Harbor. So I thought I might read you some words that were written long ago by Thomas Schilling regarding the original Pearl Harbor. Surprise, when it happens to a government, is likely to be complicated, diffuse, and a bureaucratic thing. It includes neglect of responsibility, but also responsibility so poorly defined or so ambiguously delegated that actions get lost. It includes gaps in intelligence, but also this is, this intelligence right, that, like a string of pearls, too precious to wear, is too sensitive to give to those who need it. It includes the alarm that fails to work, but also the alarm that has gone off so often it has been disconnected. It includes the unalert watchman, but also the one who knows he'll be chewed out by his superior if he gets higher authority out of bed. It includes the contingencies that occur to no one, but also those that everyone assumes somebody else is taking care of. It includes straightforward procrastination, but also decisions protracted by internal disagreement. It includes, in addition, the inability of individual human beings to rise to occasion until they are sure it is the occasion, which is usually too late. Unlike movies, real life provides no musical background to tip off to the climax. Finally, as at Pearl Harbor surprise may include some measure of genuine novelty introduced by the enemy and possibly some sheer bad luck. The results at Pearl Harbor was sudden, concentrated, and dramatic. The failure, however, was cumulative, widespread, and rather drearily familiar. This is why surprise when it happens to a government can't by, cannot be described just in terms of startled people. Whether at Pearl Harbor or at the Berlin Wall, surprise is everything involved in a government's failure to anticipate effectively. Now, you might recognize Dr. Schelling's words from the forward to Roberta Holstetter's book about Pearl Harbor. However, is my time up? It, it is, if you could move to. Okay, let me just say this. Each one of us must be
be involved. 9-11 didn't strike just Republicans. It was Democrats and everyone else. And we, representing the people, need to have a voice in this process. And I think the Shays uh, Maloney bill is our voice. And so please, Mr. Chairman, you need to help us as we represent millions of Americans formulate a posture and a response that services Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Let the chair note that um, I guess I'm going back to the V-chip vote on the Telecommunications Act where Mr. Burton put on the floor a motion to recommit forthwith was the term, terms he used uh, where that became had the effect of a substitute amendment. Uh, a motion to recommit doesn't necessarily send the bill back through the committees. If you put the motion on so it's reported forthwith to the House, it comes immediately right back to the House for a revote with that as the underlying amendment and has the same kind of power. Parliamentary, that's, that is a doable uh, proposition. And that's traditionally been a, a tool of the minority, uh, whether they were a Republican minority or a, a Democratic minority, uh, when they're not able to get their amendments through the rules of process. Uh, it's, uh, even if this committee were to adopt uh, the Shays uh, 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 substitute here, which I'm about to rule out of order under House rules, I'm, and I really have no choice. Um, it, it, it would be marked up again by rules because it would be in conflict with other uh, committees, and it would just end up delaying the process and making this committee uh, in a relevancy. So the chair is going to rule. Uh, the gentleman's amendment would amend portions of the bill that are not within the committee's jurisdiction. Pursuant to House Rule 12, the Speaker has referred for our consideration only those portions of the bill that are within the committee's jurisdiction. Uh, the amendment, therefore, is not in order. Would you like me to recognize him? Um, gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment offered by Mr. Cooper to the amendment in nature of substitute Mr. to H.R. 10. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Amendment be considered as read. Uh, I'll reserve a point of order, not having it before me yet, but uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have what I think is a very modest and I hope a bipartisan amendment here. What it would do is add a few safeguards to H.R. 10, safeguards that I think this committee has supported for virtually every federal agency, safeguards such as having an IG, an inspector general, who can do a real and thorough job. Safeguards like having a chief financial officer. Safeguards like having a human resources or human capital officer. Those are really the key provisions of this amendment. There would also be a privacy officer because I think all of us on both sides of the aisle should be concerned about civil liberties issues. Uh, finally, it would encourage, and this is just hortatory language, it is not binding, encourage um, declassification of the materials. It would not change any classification guidelines, but it would encourage, as so many national security studies have suggested, as has the 9-11 Commission, that we do not continue this process of endless over-classification of documents. But the key provision, Mr. Chairman, is really to establish a strong and effective IG. We all know not only how many dollars IGs across federal government have saved for taxpayers, we also know that they help an agency function in a more accountable and fairer fashion, the way we all want government to run. And I think, Mr. Chairman, unintentionally a mistake was made in the drafting of H.R. 10. We all know that H.R. 10 had to be put together in a pretty rapid fashion, and we all know that only one side of the aisle was consulted in doing so. But this is an example of a mistake, I think, that sometimes can result from that process. And the mistake is this. In H.R. 10, it says that the CIA IG would somehow become the IG for the new National Intelligence Director, who will have oversight over some 15 intelligence agencies. Well, how can that be possible? No human being can do that job. To take the CIA IG, who's already busy with his own duties, and suddenly give him responsibility for oversight for 14 other agencies? And remember that the CIA director will no longer be running the show. The 
new national intelligence director will be doing that, will have oversight over all of the intelligence community, as our own president has suggested. So I think it, it's an anomaly. It would be as if we required the Army IG to somehow have IG responsibilities for all of our armed forces. That would put the Army IG in an impossible situation. So I think that we need to correct the drafting mistake that was done in H.R. 10 regarding uh, the IG position. I think it's also very important, and all of us realize, whether you're in private business or in government, we have to have a CFO. That's not an unnecessary addition. We have to have somebody who knows uh, the human resources side of the equation so that we can have appropriate personnel policies. We need to make sure that privacy is safeguarded. Now, I'm well aware that in the administration's document of Tuesday, the so-called uh, SAP, Statement of Administration Policy, they were somewhat critical of the Collins-Lieberman bill for what they called excessive detail in describing the office of the National Intelligence Director. We're very sensitive to that concern. And in my amendment, we leave out half or more of the detail that Collins-Lieberman or Shays Maloney has in their bill. We're very sensitive to the administration concern. For example, we're so sensitive that we actually put less detail in the provision uh, talking about the chief information officer. If you read H.R. 10, you'll see it goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs talking about the duties of that information officer, information technology officer. Well, information technology, as we all know, is one of the most rapidly changing areas. Um, so we have a much briefer description of those duties. So that person can have the flexibility to do the job well. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to reserve the balance of my time, we are trying to strike a modest and bipartisan compromise here to improve H.R. 10, not to hurt it, to make sure that it comes closer to achieving the goals that were set by the 9-11 Commission and their terrific work, come closer to achieving the goals that uh, were set out by uh, Shays Maloney, but we do not duplicate uh, those provisions. We cherry pick the best of them, uh, provisions that this committee has helped originate in the case of IG legislation and CFO legislation, provisions that apply to every other federal agency, and we just want to, them to apply and to apply fairly to the new National Intelligence Director's Office that our own president has called for. So. I think it's a very fair and appropriate amendment. I hope that the chair will rule it within the jurisdiction of this committee. We're trying to be cooperative and fair. We're trying to be bipartisan. And to me, this helps pick out some of the best provisions of Shays Maloney to include in this bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Well, I, I thank the gentleman uh, for his eloquent uh, statement. I got good news and bad. Good news is I think this is within the committee's jurisdiction, so I will withdraw my point of order. Um, bad news uh, from my perspective, as I don't think I can support it, and, and a couple reasons. Um, first of all, um, this strikes the reorganization authority for intelligence agencies, which we think is very important. I'm not sure that the first time Congress passes this and it goes out and gets implemented that we get it right. And one of the difficulties we, we found with this, the Senate got around it by referring it to one committee. The House leadership decided to send this to a lot of committees. But there is a huge uh, uh, bureaucratic turf war that goes on with any kind of reorganization. Just in drafting this, getting the DOD folks together with the intel people and defending turf. Uh, becomes complicated. So what we put into this bill was should there be additional changes in this area, uh, the President will be able to come up with a reorganization plan on the, the administration, Republican or Democrat, will be able to come up with their own reorganization plan, take the initiative and send it to Congress uh, for a vote up or down without amendment. Uh, allow the administration to say this is what we think will work and send it up here and not let it get bogged down with all the different committees of jurisdiction uh, who want to protect their own turf. This amendment strikes that. And uh, we think executive reorganization authority ought to be broader, but in this legislation we've narrowed it just for intelligence agencies. And this strikes that. And we think that's an important component of this legislation so that we don't have to go through this again in a year or two years again. And it, we will allow administrations to take the lead and come up here and not be bogged down in fights between the House and the Senate and between different committees of jurisdiction. That's one reason. Second, my second concern is uh, the, leaving the IG out wasn't a drafting mistake. It was in the original version. 
that was drafted between the Intelligence Committee uh, and the uh, uh, Armed Services Committee, we insisted on taking it out. And the reason for that is the, the Office of National Intelligence Director we envisioned to be a small, nimble office with a very clear mission to provide intelligence and analysis for the President and the entire government. The uh, administration's statement of policy on the Senate bill did, as, as the gentleman noted, is concerned about excessive and unnecessary detail in the structure and that it constructs a cumbersome new bureaucracy and a legislative mandated bureaucracy they believe will hinder, not help, the efforts to strengthen U.S. intelligence. This is a small office. This is more akin to the National Security Council, who doesn't have any of these appendages on it. It's certainly not a massive Homeland Security type agency with numerous operational responsibilities. And I'm afraid that the thrust of the gentleman's amendment will, will make this a bureaucracy. You'll have more people there uh, doing uh, uh, the, those kind of functions than you will actually uh, collating intelligence. And we think that defeats the purpose of what the commission wanted and what we think goes here. We want the office to be quick and agile, not large and, and plotting. Uh, we're bringing numerous established agencies and organizations in an effort to synthesize and develop the best intelligence product we can in conducting the war on terror. And to the extent you're putting up in, in, in inspector generals and chief information officers or any of these others, I, I think it really uh, detracts from the mission uh, at, at hand. Besides, every reporting agency working through this agency has all of those uh, safeguards in it. Um, the, uh, regardless of the, regarding the declassification board, the issue is subject to a point, uh, it, well, I'll just leave that out at this point and just say I don't believe uh, uh, that I can support this uh, amendment for the reasons that I have uh, stated. Uh, gentleman from Mr. Massachusetts, Chairman. Mr. Tenney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm profoundly disappointed to hear the chairman of, uh, of this committee, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, tell us that you don't want Congress to exercise its responsibilities nor this committee to exercise its responsibilities. I think Mr. Cooper was, was eloquent in talking about the need to have some accountability here. I think the 9-11 Commission in its work was very adamant about the idea that Congress's oversight responsibilities had to be commensurate with any additional executive power that was granted. And a lot of times when we're doing our oversight work, it is an inspector general or a CIO or a CFO or somebody like that that allows us to have the information and get the inspected work done upon which we can act that gives us the information to review and helps us in our work and that's the proper check on the NID's office to have those things implemented. But beyond that, allowing the President to, re to just reorganize uh, and bring to us something we have to vote up and down on is a total abrogation of Congress's responsibility. I'm shocked to look around at my colleagues here and see them like lambs saying, all right, well, we'll just put something into law or do our legislative function and then we'll send it off. And when the White House says they just want to re-legislate, they'll just write up something and send it back, and we have to take it up or down. Look at each other. Look at one another and tell me whether or not that's nonsense, whether you came here to have the White House and the executive do all the work or whether you came here to legislate, whether you're going to take the responsibility. Yes, it'll go back and forth from committee to committee. And yes, it'll be some differences in the Senate and the House. That's the legislative process. That's what you're here to do that you would sit there and sit around and say, no, we're going to just abrogate that responsibility. We're going to fork it over to the administration. We're going to let the executive come down here and take whatever work we do, throw it out the window, reorganize all the departments, put it on our desk and say to you, up or down. Because the new dog in town is the administration, is the executive, and the lap dogs in town are the people in the legislative branches. That's wrong. That's not what people elect you to do. That's not why they send you here. And it's not what we should tolerate. Our responsibility is to legislate. It's our responsibility to decide how we're going to structure these departments. It's our responsibility to decide how this will be set up. And if the legislature does that work, then it'll take time. There'll be differences. But we'll iron it out, and every voice of every American in this country will be heard through their representative. And if the executive wants to weigh in, let them recommend something. Let, us get, let them give us their advice and counsel. That's the way it's supposed to work. And we should consider it seriously and with respect. And we should make sure that we deliberate with those things that it recommends in mind. But in the end, ultimately, the responsibility is ours as legislators to legislate. And I, again, am profoundly disappointed that anybody on this committee, and particularly Mr. Chairman, I don't mean this personally, but you, who should be protecting the rights and privileges of this committee, would insinuate that you would just abdicate that over to the executive and let them come down with a bill that would say, we're reorganizing all the work that you did, we're throwing it out, and you have to take it up or down because, gee, we don't like the fact that there are differences between committees of jurisdiction. We don't like the fact that there are differences between members. We don't like the fact that the chambers, the Senate, and the House may disagree. 
and in, in the end, we'll just give it all over to the executive to do whatever they wanted to do. That is not what the 9-11 Commission asked us to do. That is not what people that vote for us ask us to do. Do our job. Don't give it to somebody else. Stand up and do the work and take the responsibility. I yield back to balance my time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? But, uh, um, let me just ask, uh, let, me, let me just respond briefly to the gentleman before I recognize it. I, I, uh, we're not abrogating any responsibility, but reorganization authority was an authority this Congress had from 1932 to 1984. We have limited that in this case to the intelligence community uh, because of the different jurisdictions that are coming into play that frankly get in the way. I'm not sure you always get uh, uh, a sound, um, sound legislation when you get everybody just looking after their turf. Uh, but you get, up in just a second, but the, in, in this particular case, um, the Congress is not out of the loop. You can vote it up or down. And on uh, at least two dozen occasions during that period when Congressman uh, Congress gave the President Permanent Reorganization Authority, reorganizations were voted down. But what it does do is it allows the administrative branch, the executive branch of government that has to implement these findings, a way to come to us in a package and say, we think this is the best way we can protect the homeland. We think this is the best way we can gather intelligence and send that up uh, because they're the ones ultimately that are held responsible if something goes wrong. The 9-11 report points fingers at the administrations, but, but, cause, but not, not at Congress. They're the ones ultimately held accountable. I think they ought to have reorganization authority. So I don't think it's an abrogation of responsibility. I think it's a practical way to try to recognize that, number one, we may not have all the answers in this legislation, and number two, if we need to fix it, we need to fix it quickly. The other thing is it does set a time limit. When they send legislation up here uh, recommending something, we have to act within a certain period of time so Congress doesn't take its uh, sweet times. One of the criticisms I've heard from members today is, well, now, instead of just taking the Senate, I mean, members here want to just take the House out of this and say, well, the Senate's done this. Let's just adopt the Senate bill without the House being involved at all. You talk about an abrogation of responsibility. You know, what are we? And we also represent constituencies. We all should, so should have a say in this. And the minute we differ from the Senate, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're, we're the bad guys. And here the gentleman is saying, <laughs> f f uh, in, in something we get to vote up or down, making the opposite argument. So I'm a little confused myself, but no, I don't want to take us out of it. I want to keep us involved, but I want the system to work. I think this works. I think this amendment takes that authority uh, away from the executive and intelligence branch of government, and for that reason, I oppose the amendment. Uh, I'd be happy Mr. to yield to my friend, thank sure. You. you know, Mr. Chairman, I respectfully, again, certainly the finger was pointed at the administration during the process of of what led up to 9-11 and for the work that was or wasn't done. But it was also pointed at Congress for not having the proper oversight. And when you say that you're going to take the legislative responsibility and just hand it over to the executive, who then can just reshuffle the deck and do whatever it wants to do and hand it back for simply an up or down thing, you are, again, ex you know, failing to exercise your oversight and failing to exercise your legislative prerogative here. It is exactly what you are doing. And the fact that, you know, the Senate we may have a different version of this, and some people in the House and the 9-11 Commission prefer the Senate's version, and that people can make that argument here is not inconsistent with the fact that we think these things ought to be debated and differences ought to be worked out or somebody ought to win or lose on a vote, but it ought to go through the legislative process and ought not to have the executive come in and do the legislative function. Uh, you could take what your arguments on that and say, gee, it's just more convenient and neater mm -hmm. for the executive to come down here and tell us what to do all the time and let it go give us an up or down opportunity in 90 days. You could do that with every single item from the Department of Defense to Homeland Security to education all the way down the line. It's not the way this country is established. It's not representative well, of government. Well, it's not what we're sent here to do. And I, I for one, am not going to sit here and let Just reclaiming my time. Congress uh, abrogate the responsibilities in this respect. Reclaim my time. Field. Democratic Congresses did this for 50 years. Just, uh, and, and I think it worked pretty effectively. It came to a crash in 1984 over workers' rights issues uh, after, with the Reagan administration. Uh, we had Paul Volcker up here and a number of other uh, Democrats and Republican leaders from the executive branch argue this ought to be applied gov government-wide. We held hearings on this earlier uh, this year. And I think this is a very modest and common sense step. But the gentleman and I disagree on this, and I respect his, his uh, view on this and appreciate his interest. The gentleman from California. I, I, I think we ought to understand that Congress set up a 9-11 commission. They made recommendations where uh, taking some, ignoring most. But whatever Congress does, it does. But we shouldn't do something, get the president to sign it, and have tucked away in the bill the ability of the president to rewrite it all because he could completely rewrite the law under the power that's uh, delegated to him. 
That's a, a, a tremendous ab abdication of our responsibility. It's a transfer of enormous power to the executive branch. And then whatever he then proposes will come for an upper round vote. We won't even have a chance for amendments. So I just want to point that out, that I, I think uh, what this bill does and, and what the uh, Cooper Amendment would correct is give the president to redo the whole law. We might as well not even have a Congress. If, you, if the chairman said, well, the administration is going to be held responsible, we all ought to be held responsible. Both branches of government should be held responsible. If Congress, not just for its failure to oversight, but for its failure to legislate and really mean it, if we legislate and then say to the president, this is, this is the best we're going to do. If you want to redo it, then it's up to you. And we won't even have a chance to offer amendments to his uh, 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 review, his, uh, his, his completely revamped proposal. So I strongly support the Cooper Amendment and urge members to vote for it. Okay, thank you. A gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, um, I would ask that we have separate votes on these two issues. When I called up for my amendment from the desk, I asked for the Cooper Amendment and stapled to the end of it was the tyranny amendment. Um, so I think to promote accountability on this committee, we should have a separate vote on the Cooper Amendment and the tyranny amendment. Now, I'm a strong supporter of the tyranny amendment, but they're very different issues. They are. And in most of your statement, you were criticizing the tyranny amendment. Oh, now I understand why you went after me. I <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so I thought it was your amendment. Me, okay. It's very important. Sorry, John. In the 9-11 Commission report, Inspectors General are mentioned 92 times. Almost every four pages in that great report, they had to rely on the work of the Inspector General. Well, let me General. ask unanimous consent that we consider the seri item and have seri item votes. Is there objection to that? Without objection, we'll have seri item votes. I thank the gentleman for the clarification. Any other debate on this issue? Uh, if, uh, yes, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to. Uh, uh, lend my support to the Cooper Amendment tonight. I do want to say that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and, and uh, quite a few members on this committee have been involved in the investigation of the FBI for their misconduct over a 40-year uh, period. And uh, one of the principal failures that we have found, and, and I think you'd be in agreement, is that there was a lack of accountability uh, within the FBI. There was a lack of oversight in the Congress. And to suggest that uh, as Mr. Tierney has so eloquently stated, that we would remove ourselves from this process. Uh, we have a system of checks and balances in the Constitution that uh, give a certain responsibility to this Congress. And, and to, to somehow abrogate uh, or remove ourselves from this process uh, will result in a, a, a drop in that, that accountability, I believe. And it's something that is very, very important to this whole process. The, the, uh, the IG position, um, as stated in Mr. Cooper's amendment, would, would be the conduit through which Congress would be able to do its job. And I, I'm just fearful that, that if we send it back to the President, as we have suggested in this bill, for his, his own uh, re-legislation, when it comes back here on an up or down vote, it is not a vote of, of what will serve this country best. It will be a question of do you support the president or do you not support the president, regardless of the merits of the bill. And in that case, whether it's a Democratic president or a Republican president, it becomes a matter of politics. And, and, and I know the tremendous pressure that will be upon the Republican members to support their president. And I know very well the pressure that will be on the Democrats if it's a Democrat in, in the White House. And I was hoping that, that on this issue, it should be above politics, if, if that is possible in this building. Uh, and, and we should look at the long-term effect on our national security and the way our intelligence uh, agencies work regardless of whether the White House is, is occupied by a Democrat or a Republican, what is best for the American people in the long term? And that is why I, I think Mr. Cooper and Mr. Tierney are, are right on the mark, and, uh, and, and I just want to be on the record as supporting both of their amendments. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Questions on the uh, uh, amendment first, uh, on the Cooper Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 
No, the Chairman, in the opinion of the, the ayes have it, we will vote this. I'll ask for a roll call on that. Uh, the, uh, secondly, the tyranny amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. And we'll have a roll call on that as well. Uh, looking at the numbers, <laughs> you would have asked for a roll call as well. Uh, Ms. McCollum, I understand you have to be somewhere else. Uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment offered by Ms. McCollum to the amendment in the nature of substitute at the end of Chapter 1 of Mr. Subtitle Chair. H of Mr. Title Chair. 5. Clerk will report. He did. He did. Do you want to suspend? Y yes, if I okay. could get the Chair's attention. I'm sorry, Ms. McCollum. That's okay. You're very busy today. I would like to suspend the, her the reading. Okay, oh, uh, without objection, so water. General Lady is recognized for five minutes. I, I apologize. There's some. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I have a, uh, I'm offering this uh, along with uh, Congressman uh, Cummings of Maryland. My amendment would add a critical recommendation of the bipartisan, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen. Can we have uh, order, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we, can we start the General Lady's time again? I'd like to get her some continuity. General Lady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my amendment would add a critical recommendation of the bipartisan 9-11 Commission by creating an independent board with the, uh, within the executive office of the President, which will protect our civil liberties and our democratic freedoms. This board will analyze and review the actions of the executive branch, ensure that the constitutional guaranteed civil liberties and privacy of the American people are protected and respected. The 9-11 Commission identified the need for such an office within the federal government to ensure that our freedoms and liberties are not dismissed or trampled on by intrusive federal laws or federal agents, but appropriately protected and respected. The 9-11 Commission uh, wrote, if there is a substantial change in the way we collect and share intelligence, there should be a voice within the executive branch for those concerns. Today, at our own peril, this voice in the executive branch is silent. My amendment will help ensure that our freedoms are protected. For example, many of us have serious concerns about the expansions of the Patriot Act within H.R. 10 and the bill's potential to undermine our liberties, eroding the very freedoms we are fighting to protect in this war on terrorism. For this reason, I want to state again, we need to formally establish in the law a strong voice for our liberties and for our freedoms to ensure that they are constitutionally guaranteed civil liberties and constitutionally guarantee the privacy of the American people, that they are protected and respect, respected. The President recently issued an executive order to create a civil liberties board. Therefore, some might say my amendment is not needed. The President's symbolic act is well intended and it is welcomed, but we should never entrust the freedoms of the American people to a presidential order which can be revoked at any moment's notice. The Congress must act and exercise our voice and our wisdom and our power to protect this nation's freedoms. This executive order asks the very agencies and departments that are likely to be subject of challenges and complaints to sit on the President's board. This is the fox both guarding the hen house as well as investigating both who took the eggs and who ate the hens. This is a recipe for cover-up, not accountability. Furthermore, the board has no requirement to meet regularly, no mandate to investigate anything unless required by an agency, and no subpoena authority. Our amendment, in contrast, will follow the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission and create a board comprised of of a bipartisan collection of members who are independent of the administration. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board would be required to report back to Congress and possess full subpoena power. The sole mission of the board would be to protect the freedoms and privacies of the American people from an overreaching federal bureaucracy. The board will advise the president on matters of privacy and civil liberties, as well as coordinate with the executive branch agencies and their leadership. The board is a reasonable measure to prevent the abuses of power that Americans should never fear or be unjustly targeted or victimized by their own government. As the nine partisan 9-11 uh, commission states, 
The choice between security and liberty is a false choice. There is nothing more likely to endanger America's liberties than the success of terrorist attacks at home. Our history has shown us that insecurity threatens liberty. Yet if our liberties are curtailed, we lose the values we are struggling to defend. And I share this statement. Now more than ever, we must strengthen our national security. We must defend our democratic values and protect our individual freedoms and liberties. These are all necessary to win the war on terrorism. I strongly urge my colleagues to follow the advice of the 9-11 Commission and create this independent board. And I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady. Um, this is not in the Senate bill, is that correct? It is in the Senate bill. It is in the Senate bill? Yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do you know where it is in the Senate bill? We can't find it. Um, H.R. 10, as you know, established, we already have a civil liberties office uh, officer in this bill that reports directly uh, to the National Intelligence Director responsible for overseeing and ensuring that the actions of the intelligence community fully comply with existing civil liberties protection. This uh, puts on top of that a, a review board on top of that officer. I just don't think we need another oversight board. I, I don't think that's the direction we want to go when we're trying to streamline our intelligence gathering. Um, Op, uh, way we do business. Agencies are currently bound by the Privacy Act. They're bound by civil rights laws. Uh, if there are specific privacy or civil rights concerns that should be addressed, uh, let's consider whether we should amend the Privacy Act or the civil rights laws, not to create a roving uh, privacy watchdog, which I think that this uh, does. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security also has a privacy officer and a civil rights and civil liberties officer. These officials perform their roles best in the context of their own agencies. They're subject to review by the Inspector General in the performance of their duties. The Patriot Act directed the Department of Justice Inspector General to designate uh, an official to review allegations of abuses of civil rights and civil liberties at the Department of Justice. I think these mechanisms are sufficient. And in my judgment, these are just a bureaucratic overkill. While we all support the protection of our civil liberties, I think the kind of board that's envisioned in this amendment will not enhance civil liberties, but it just m will mire the agencies whose performances we're seeking to improve and streamline and make more efficient with additional uh, reporting and oversight uh, uh, requirements. So uh, I certainly understand where the lady is coming from. She has uh, laid out, I think, a, uh, a, a laid out her case in an able fashion. Uh, but from from my perspective, I'm going to oppose the amendment. Is there anyone else? Mr. Chair, just a point of uh, just a yeah, point yes, of comment. Yeah, yes, ma'am. It is in the Senate uh, to uh, 2854. Mm -hmm. You, oh, excuse me, 2845. You will find it on page 153, thank subtitle you. B. It is included. Okay. Th thank you Mr. very much. Chairman. Uh, going to recognize the ranking member first, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. We're in a new age now. Uh, these questions of civil liberties and privacy protections are different than we've ever known before because we're rebalancing protecting our individual liberties with uh, trying to make sure that we're more secure. I think the Commission most aptly summed it up when they said, quote, we must find ways of reconciling security with liberty since the success of one helps protect the other. The choice between security and liberty is a false choice, as nothing is more likely to endanger America's liberties than the success of a terrorist attack at home. Our history has shown us that insecurity threatens liberty, yet if our liberties are curtailed, we lose the values that we are struggling to defend." End quote. I think that's so important that we're going through a, an evolving process as we try to make us secure and not lose those liberties that are so important to us as Americans. That's why the Commission recommended, and the gentlelady from uh, Minnesota has suggested, that we have a separate 9-11 Commission working in a bipartisan fashion uh, with increased and consolidated government authority, with people on it who aren't, aren't the ones who are making the decisions that are being questioned. They'll be independent so that we can constantly review these matters. Now, the bill before us has a civil liberties officer with a lot less authority to oversee the protection of civil liberties and privacy. This officer would be designated by and operate under the authority of the National Intelligence Director. 
Now, it might be decisions by the National Intelligence Director that will give rise to review of whether civil liberties and privacy are being intruded upon. Uh, and uh, there are no reporting requirements in the bill before us to Congress or the public, as opposed to what would be in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, amendment that's now being considered. So I strongly support it, uh, the amendment by the gentlelady from Minnesota. I think it's wise policy. Let's don't correct, try to correct these problems later. Let's try to correct the balance as we go along in this new evolving structure. And I want to yield whatever time I have I to the gentleman from I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Maryland. Chairman, <clears throat> I certainly associate myself with the words of Ms. McCollum and my colleague, Mr. Waxman. You know, Mr. Chairman, whenever I go into my communities and I talk about civil liberties, people say that they want to make sure we protect ourselves with regard to acts like what happened on 9-11. But at the same time, they're concerned that there is no balance. That is, when they go to their library, knowing that somebody can come right behind them and say, what library book did Ms. Jones read? They are concerned about the Patriots Act. They are concerned about the democracy that they inherited when they were born and wonder whether they will be able to pass on that same democracy to their children and children and grandchildren yet unborn. And I think that, you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you just laid out all these wonderful things that are available. But I think that, that when you talk about the liberties, civil liberties of this country, this is what this country is all about. There is no such thing as too much oversight. We've got to be careful. We spent a phenomenal amount of time, Mr. Chairman, addressing the issue of terrorists. But at the same time, we have to have a balance in this country so that we make sure that we send to generations yet unborn a, the same or a better democracy than the one that we inherited. And I think Ms. McCollum has been done an outstanding job of putting this amendment together. It is balanced. It makes sense. And it safeguards something, one of the, the very, very significant building blocks of this nation, and that is our liberty. That's what people admire about this country. They admire the opportunities, the liberty, the freedoms. And to have a safeguard in the legislation to make sure that people can, on a bipartisan basis, come in and take a look at this thing and address it, I think is very, very significant. And so I hope Mr. Shays is saying to you right now, Mr. Chairman, that this is a reasonable amendment and that you should accept it, because I think that it is. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else wish to, to address it, Mr. Van Hall? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, commend my, my colleagues, Ms. McCollum and Mr. Cummings and others, uh, for offering this very important amendment. Uh, the 9-11 Commission, again in a bipartisan fashion, talked about how important it was in the war on terrorism to strike the balance between enhanced government powers and at the same time maintenance, maintenance of civil liberties because it would be a terrible irony if in the war against terrorism we were to undermine and erode the very liberties and the very rights that we seek to protect in that effort. And that's why the Commission made a recommendation about in this area. And Mr. Chairman, you raised the, the point that you know, there are many in government now in their separate departments and agencies that are vested with some responsibility with respect to civil liberties. And the, the Commission understood that. But they also understood that there was no central focus uh, within the administration and no sort of independent uh, body. And they specifically recommended uh, the creation of a board, not an individual, a board within the executive branch, and I'm reading from the report, uh, to oversee adherence to the guidelines we recommend and the commitment the government makes to defend our civil liberties. So again, the reason the Senate put this provision in their bill and the reason it's important we adopt it here is it is something that I think, again, you have a bipartisan consensus, a unanimous vote uh, by the 9-11 uh, Commission on the creation of this, this separate board just so there's some central point uh, with some kind of independence within the government whose job it is at every juncture to say, 
all right, before we enhance the government power in a particular way, let's just make sure that in that process, we're not stripping American citizens of the very rights and the very liberties that we're fighting this war to protect. Well, I thank the gentleman. Again, we allow a civil liberties officer in here that reports directly to the NID. Uh, I, I just happen to think an oversight board uh, can have a chilling effect on those people that are trying to gather intelligence and disseminate it. But it's a philosophical issue, uh, and I understand the great concern uh, by my colleagues in the Commission on this. Uh, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Uh, the Chairman knows how. Would you like a roll call on that, Ms. McCollum? Uh, we will we'll, uh, roll the vote. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. One. Amendment offered by Mr. Deal of Georgia to the amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 10. In section 3052A1, page 27. consent to be considered as read. Yeah, without, yeah, without objection, so what a gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I understand the importance of this legislation, and I understand that there are many issues that are very big and broad and perhaps like, uh, lack specificity. I want to talk about one provision that is very personal to me, an issue that I have been working on for a very long time that I think goes to the very heart of what we want to do if we want security in this country. The amendment that I propose would lower the time frame in which states must conform to a uniform standard for the issuance of driver's licenses and uh, birth certificates, specifically as to driver's licenses. My interest in this first peaked immediately after 9-11 when it became obvious that there were at least four states in this country who were openly issuing driver's licenses to people illegally in this country. We knew at that time that three out of the 19 hijackers had such driver's licenses. We've now learned, according to the New York Commissioner of Motor Vehicles, that 18 out of the 19 had fraudulently issued driver's licenses. Now, I commend the chairman and I commend the work of those who have put this provision together to finally come up with some uniform standards. My, my problem is the time frame for the implementation of them. This bill, as it is originally proposed, allows three years from the enactment of this legislation for the states to bring that into conformity. I think that is far too long. I think one year is adequate time. The bill does provide that if they cannot do it within the time frame. They can be granted waivers if they can prove the reasons why they have not been able to do so. But five weeks after 9-11, when I became aware of this problem and the magnitude of it, I wrote a letter along with several of my other colleagues to the governors of each state urging them not to grant reciprocity to those states where driver's license were knowingly being issued to people illegally in the country. In other words, if you get a driver's license from a state that does not require that you be a citizen or a resident, legal resident of this country, then they can go to other states and by reciprocity have been granted the right to have a driver's license of that other state. You would be surprised at the responses that we got back from members of the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators who I understand is the group with whom this time frame has now been negotiated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, one of the most vehement was from the Commissioner of Virginia defending the policies of your state, which have now subsequently been changed, and I commend them for modifying them accordingly. My point, though, is there is great resistance to do anything other than what they are currently doing. In 2004, in July, as we were considering the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, I went before the Rules Committee and I had one little simple amendment that simply said this, Congress urges the states to cooperatively develop uniform standards for state driver's licenses. We didn't have the support of AMVA and we didn't have the support of the Rules Committee. They wouldn't even allow us to include that encouraging language to do what this bill now finally gets around to doing. My point is this, a year is plenty of time. What is happening is States are issuing multi-year driver's licenses. Some are five years, some are six years, others may be at different time frames. If we wait three years to implement this, 
What's going to happen when somebody gets a driver's license illegally under these standards that is good for six more years? Under this current legislation, if we don't change it, they do not have to bring these standards into place until 2007. That is far too long. We are already too far beyond the point. If AMVA is the agency that we have based the three-year standard on, I understand they have not even agreed to the standards. They've agreed to the three years, but they haven't even agreed to the standards. It's time for Congress to take an affirmative position on this issue. There is adequate time within the next year to bring these standards into conformity and for the states to comply. And why is the issue so important? If 18 out of the 19 hijackers had fraudulent driver's licenses, if we want to find out one place to start to do something to make sure this event is not repeated, we ought to start with the very document that got them on those airplanes. One year is enough. That's what this amendment says. Change it from three to one year to bring them into conformance. And if they can't comply, let them prove to the federal agency why they can't comply, and this legislation gives them the right to be granted a waiver for an additional period of time. I thank the chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me say to my friend, uh, he's made a very strong uh, case, and I think that philosophically I'm, I'm in agreement with him. Um, but we, have, we negotiated this fact, this uh, the provision out with the Judiciary Committee who could have had jurisdiction and, and waived it in this point, and the uh, American Associate Motor Vehicles Administrators, uh, and I, I feel honor bound to, to oppose it. I think other members may see fit to, to support it, and I understand that and respect that, and, and uh, so uh, this is in the, because uh, you've laid it out. You give them the flexibility, but you set a closer deadline uh, for them um, uh, to do that. The deadline of three years was established. Uh, it wasn't arbitrary. It was, as you said, talk, after talking to the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, the Judiciary Committee, this was the conclusion that was uh, arrived at. Um, there are some states that are still saying they can't even do it in three years. I think maybe the gentleman's right. They, they need appropriate incentives, and if they had to do it tomorrow, they could probably do it tomorrow. Um, so he, he makes some compelling points, but I'm not going to. Uh, I, I'm personally not going to support the amendment, but I think uh, a lot of members will probably, uh, who, who believe this is an important provision in the bill, are going to want to move that up, and I think it will have some salience with them. There are, of course, a number of members of this committee that don't like this provision at all, and uh, therefore moving this up uh, probably makes this even more unattractive than the underlying uh, provision. Uh, anyone else wish to address this? If not, uh, the. Uh, the vote is on the amendment of the gentleman from Georgia. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 Being the chair that knows how, would you like a roll call no, on that? Ask for roll call. We'll put a roll call on Mr. Deal. Uh, you have one other amendment? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I will no. not offer it. All right. Thank you uh, very much. Right. Mr. Waxman. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I have two amendments and I want to offer them separately, but while I have the opportunity. And I'll try to be as brief as possible. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, the First Amendment. Uh, well, the clerk will report the amendments once the, he identifies. The First right. Amendment is on the same issue of driver license. Number one, yeah. amendment offered by Mr. Waxman to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 10, strike chapter one of subtitle e. Consent, the Without amendment objection, amendment the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Deal wanted to move up the requirements in the bill to one year rather than three years. My amendment would change the requirements of the bill to follow the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. Uh, this bill doesn't do that. Instead, it sets out a detailed requirement for state and local governments. Where does that come from? Republicans always tell us we're, we're not going to have Washington decide everything. We're going to allow more determination at the state and local government. Instead, the bill specifies nine items that must appear on every driver's license. Well, will the gentleman yield for just one second? Yeah. I'll just make sure we have the right amendment here. But the underlying amendment doesn't tell the states what they have to do. It just says if you want to use a driver's license as a federal ID to get on airplanes or, or the other like, you have to comply with this. That's right. But and if they want to use it as a driver's license, they're welcome to do that and ignore let it. Me, let me uh, clarify what happens under this legislation for driver's licenses. This is amendment number two, just okay. a clarification. Number two. Do you want me to redesignate it? Redesignate it, please. Amendment offered by Mr. Weissman to the amendment in nature of substitute H.R. 10, strike sections 3, 
051 through 3067 and insert the following and conform the table. Okay, Mr. Consent, it's, it's waived and the gentleman is re-recognized yeah. for five minutes, sir. Uh, the bill sets out what states must do to issue a driver's license. Now, I understand driver's license is an important um, identification, but here Washington is telling the states that they have to uh, do the following to get a driver's license, issue a driver's license. You have to come in with a, a photo ID, a birth certificate, proof of a valid social security number, and proof of your name and address. So then you turn this over, most likely you don't have it, and then you have to get it to them. And then every document has to be verified. So the state and local government's going to have to verify it. Every state in which you get a driver's license has to keep copies of all your documents for seven to 10 years. There are no explicit privacy safeguards for these documents. Uh, there are no penalties for employees who misuse the documents. The personnel in every motor vehicle office are required to get security clearances. Then the states are required to place all of this information on you in a database, license information, driver's record, points, etc. Then the databases are linked, and anyone with access to the system will have access to all this information. And then there are special requirements for non-citizens uh, would preempt state laws that provide driver's license to non-citizens. Well, the point of all this is can you imagine what a nightmare it's going to be when someone goes in to get a driver's license and they have to deal with so much bureaucracy that's ordered at the federal level for the states to implement? I think that uh, this level of detail is a mistake. We don't have the expertise to design these systems and legislation, and the consequences of our errors will come down on state and local officials. We haven't spent time working with state and local officials to understand how these systems vary from state to state. As a result, we don't understand the consequences of this language. My amendment replaces the language in the Davis proposal with language that's more consistent with the guidance from the 9-11 Commission. If we go forward with the chairman's language, our driver's licenses and birth certificates will make most of our people in this country angry, will place unreasonable demands on municipal governments throughout the country. Getting a driver's license could take hours, if not days. Nearly everyone in the country will have to get a new birth certificate in the next three years. Uh, people will show up at their local motor vehicle license office with a fistful of documents required by this bill. And, uh, I, I, and, and then I think we run the danger that this database could be invaded by a hacker and then the information can be given out to someone who can steal your identity. I, I uh, know of a person who just went in to get um, uh, Social Security benefits. So when you go in to get Social Security benefits, they ask you to get your birth certificate. I don't know how many people have their birth certificate, but then you've got to get a, a, a verified birth certificate. So you've got to file uh, uh, a, um, a document that's been notarized. You've got to go find a notarizer. Uh, a notary to get it notarized. I just think, and I know I sound like a Republicans used to sound when they were sincere in arguing these points, Washington doesn't know best. Setting up new requirements and new bureaucracies and putting all these burdens that make no sense should not be the role of those of us in the Congress of the United States. I think the 9-11 Commission debated this very, very carefully and recognized that their approach could get us to the result that we want which is driver's licenses that are secure enough for us to look at as a, as a, a identification, but not to spell it out in such detail here uh, in legislation that will put such an enormous burden on everyone. So I offer this amendment in good faith. I hope it can be expect, accepted by Democrats and Republicans, by people who don't believe in, in uh, federal government putting all these burdens and requirements. Mm -hmm. And if you do reject this, and even if you do adopt that amendment by Mr. Deal to move it up to one year, I want to warn you, duck when the public sees that they have to go out and get all these documents just to get a driver's license. And when it's time to renew their driver's license, they have to get all those documents all over again. And if the state doesn't think it's ne necessary, they're told, too bad, federal law requires it. So set up the database, get the, all these documents verified, maybe people come in with all these documents, and, um, uh, and that's the only way you'll get uh, the driver's license in, in exchange. So I, um, I urge the support for this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weissman. I rise uh, in opposition to this. First of all, I'd like to put in the record a letter from the 9-11 families 
for a secure America is supporting uh, the underlying amendment, uh, which this, uh, w with signatures on it, uh, that I'd like this put in the uh, record. Um, both California, your state, and my state of Virginia are already in compliance with this. This will be a great convenience for our citizens when they get their Social Security cards. They won't have to bring their birth certificates because under this, all they can show is their current driver's license and it will save them all of the paperwork that Mr. Waxman uh, just mentioned on this that one of his constituents had to go through. So we think this is a benefit uh, uh, to them. Um, we worked very carefully uh, with uh, the uh, American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators uh, on this, the National Association of Public Health Statistics and Information Systems uh, on the model for this. And uh, we think this is important. More and more states around the country are adopting this. And uh, for that reason, uh, this is a, what I would consider a gutting amendment. I'm going to pose the amendment. Gentleman from, uh, yield to my friend from Georgia, who thinks that our provision is, is too weak as it is. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I agree that uh, states are already moving in that direction. Many states have already actually moved in, uh, that far. Uh, if Mr. Waxman really believes that all you need is just to present a driver's, uh, to present a birth certificate uh, or some other document such as a social security card with no verification that those documents are valid, I submit to you, you've created nothing but another farce to, mis mis uh, uh, to deceive the public. Uh, in my district, I'm told that for $250, I can get you a, a, a birth certificate and a secur social security card and whatever name you say you are. Now, I'm sure Mr. Waxman voted to federalize the TSA employees at the airports. What good does it do to head, hand that federal employee a document, a driver's license that's based on documents that are forgeries? If we don't go back to the source documents and verify them, a driver's license based on fraudulent other documents is absolutely as useless in protecting the security of this country as what we had for those states that were issuing them to illegals to begin with. I yield back. And let me just also note, as we move to implement that in Virginia this year, there was really, a, a, from my understanding, a minimum of disruption to the other system. And we did it very shortly. It's, it, this is full of political ramifications. I said Mr. Waxman's state has this, but that's not to say it's not controversial within California because they, uh, I understand the legislature there just moved to overturn this and, and Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed uh, the legislature on this. So this, as we understand, has philosophical ramifications, which uh, Mr. Waxman has spelled out uh, very eloquently in his remarks, but I'm going to oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Any, is there any other discussion, Mr. Waxman? Would you like a last word? All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Just all opposed say no. 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 Uh, the chair as the ayes have it, but I'll ask for a roll call on that. Yeah, ask for a roll call. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a second amendment I want to do. Clerk will report. Very, very quickly. Uh, this um, uh, H.R. 10. Clerk will report. Amendment offered by Mr. Waxman, the amendment in nature substitute H.R. 10, strike Chapter 1 of Subtitle E of Title 5, and insert the following. Chapter 1. I ask unanimous consent the amendment. That objection, uh, amendment read. will be considered as read. Uh, gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment will align H.R. 10 with the 9-11 Commission recommendations regarding the appointment of senior federal officials to national security positions during a presidential transition which I expect we're going to have after the next election. The Commission recommended several steps to streamline the presidential appointment process. For example, it recommended the President-elect should submit candidates for national security positions immediately after the election to speed up the clearance process, and it recommended the Senate act on nominations in 30 days. Uh, these provisions are in the bipartisan Senate bill, but they're not in the bill before us, and my amendment would add this to the bill. At the same time, what's in the bill is a major change to our financial disclosure laws. A and uh, under current law, nominees have to disclose if they have assets worth $50 million. They have to disclose assets over $25 million and then over $5 million. Uh, this disclosure is a fundamental part of our system of open, gov open government's law. But this bill repeals these requirements in place of financial disclosure. It allows financial obfuscation. Basically, it protects people like Defense Secretary Rumsfeld they get, to ride, uh, they get to hide their true wealth. Well, I don't think that when we're talking about quick transition, that it should be simply to allow people who are wealthy to hide their assets from disclosure. I think it ought to be what the 9-11 Commission recommended, and um, it ought to be a faster process to get them approved so they can get on the job. Secrecy breeds lack of accountability. 
The public has a right to know all of the potential conflicts of interest of our wealthiest federal officials. The 9-11 Commission did not recommend this evisceration of our financial disclosure laws, and we should not be including this extraneous provision in the legislation. Reform of the disclosure laws should be handled on a government-wide basis, not just for national security rules. And so if we're going to uh, change the financial disclosure laws, let's do it across the board. But this amendment simply does what the Commission suggests, and it speeds up the confirmation process, requires a sitting president to properly brief the president-elect on national security issues. This is not the time to pass extraneous laws that leave us with, no, uh, with more problems. So my amendment strikes out the financial disclosure provision, substitutes the speedy approval process for those who are going to take uh, important positions in national security. Uh, uh, thank you. My, my, here's my concern. First of all, in our underlying legislation here, we basically note uh, that the Senate, uh, that on nominations of a national security nature, um, that the Senate is required after 30 legislative days have expired from the date on which a nomination is submitted to the Senate, such appointments should be made by the President alone. This stops the filibusters, it stops the holds, it makes sure that we have our national security and our intelligence personnel on board. One of the huge fault findings in the 9-11 Commission report was the fact that the Bush administration wasn't up and running in these uh, intelligence gathering areas uh, until April. Now part of that was the fact that the elections weren't decided until December. They lost a month uh, from November to December just getting up. But the second part of it is that these nominations through the disclosure and vetting requirements on the front end and the nominations process in the back end take an inordinate amount of time. Thirty legislative days is enough. And this, this strikes uh, that provision. No, and, Mr. And, Chairman, and instead, would you yield to me on I'd that I'd be point? happy to. That's, that's but doesn't not it my understanding, because I thought we were adding that 30-day requirement for the Senate to act, well. which I thought was a reasonable requirement. I don't think your bill has that. And our that's bill what we're trying to add. Our, our we bill. do strike out the financial disclosure provisions in your bill. Yeah. Now, I could be wrong. But our bill, let me just say, and this is something maybe we have to talk about, on page 56 and 57 uh, has it under presidential appointments, pages 56 and uh, 57, under section 5041 uh, has that uh, in there. I'm glad we ag agree on that. Uh, what I was concerned about is that it's the uh, it's a toothless sense of, of Congress resolution that doesn't mean anything that we do also often here uh, that this President and the Senate should move quicker. But let me just uh, reconfirm that with our staff. On the financial disclosure side, let me just, uh, for, uh, just to let the gentleman know, this was modeled after Senator Thompson's bill, which never got out of the Senate, but we, th we, th we thought it was a good bill in which they held hearings on, and common cause came uh, before the Senate and testified. Uh, again, as I noted in my opening remarks today, that the purpose of disclosure wasn't to reveal everybody's income, it was to look for conflicts of interest, and we thought that this better uh, met that. So it's that on that basis, uh, but I'll look the amendment over bef between now and the time where we're going to vote to see if there's any way we can uh, we can work this. Mr. But Chairman, just, you know. I, I think on the financial disclosure requirements, my view would be we do it across the board. We haven't had, maybe it was a provision in the Senate, but we really haven't looked at it. Could we just put the amendment aside while our staffs check out what uh, where we I'd be happy agree. to do that. Why don't we, we do, why don't we do uh, this and if, uh, we'll make sure we get to call it back if we can't reach a resolution. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I thank you. We have any, Mr. Shays? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the, um, the clerk has amendment number two. Chair would reserve a point of order. Amendment to H.R. 10 offered by Mr. Shays. At the end of Chapter 3 of Subtitle H of Title Move 5. Move to dispense with the reading. Thank you. And I, again, the chair reserves a point of order. Gentlemen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, this amendment would extend the sunset date of the Public Interest Declassification Board, an entity created in 2001 to set standards and make sure agency classification and declassification programs are pursued diligently and uniformly. Overclassification was cited by the 9-11 Commission as a serious impediment to the kinds of information sharing necessary to meet the threat of global, transnational, and Islamist terrorism. This board could help address the problem of overclassification and slow declassification 
if it were made operational. No appointments have ever been made to the board before President Bush made four nominations of September 10th of this year, but the board, it's amazing, but the board is due to expire December 27th, 2004. So we've got some appointments, and I believe that, that there are legislative appointments that haven't been made. Uh, just to say to you that we had a hearing, as the Ambassador Watson can point out as well, we had a hearing on overclassification. There are 500 people, 5,000 individuals in government who classified 14 million documents. We had Ms. Carol, Ms. Carol Have, have Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Counterintelligence and Security. The speculation is we have 10 to 90 percent overclassification. And when we asked her, working for the Department of Defense in an area that she is an expert, her estimate was that at least 50 percent was overclassified. So I would um, move adoption of this amendment. Um, the chair has reserved a point of order on this. and. Uh, I, I understand the gentleman's point. I wish it were, was within our jurisdiction and, and we could work with him on this, but it, this addresses a subject matter that's not within the jurisdiction of our committee under House Rules. Under House Rule 16, Clause 7, it is not germane to consider amendments that are not within the committee's uh, jurisdiction. Uh, I hope the gentleman will have an opportunity to bring this up on the floor, but it's not in order before us. So I'm going to have to rule it out, out of order. The Chair, at this point, uh, we have, uh, and I would urge all members on both sides who have amendments to let us to get them to our committee staff and we can evaluate them and work with them. We may be able to accept, accept some amendments, but we're going to have debate in a couple minutes on the uh, uh, District of Columbia gun ban on the House floor. The author of that bill is a member of this committee. The opposition is are from the com this committee will be heavily involved in that. And Mr. Waxman and I are going to go over to the floor uh, for that debate. So I'm going to declare a recess in it. Ms. Watson? Yes, on that same issue, if I could enter into a brief colloquy okay. with you. And if you would agree to, uh, on the personnel management issues, we've talked with your staff. And well, if you... Uh, let me just say, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. My staff is uh, right now talking with Mr. Uh, Van Hollen. We, look, uh, when we recess, let's look at that. If so, we can, we can may, if, if we've agreed to take it, I'm sure we will. Um, but we'll yes, have to... I can withdraw the amendment. Okay, why don't we work with it? When we come back, we'll look at that, okay? okay. I was going to just introduce, have Mr. Shays has one more... Uh, Amendment. Mr. Mr. Shays, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have seven amendments. I think they may all be ruled the same way, but I would like to at least present this, and that's the well, amendment. The chair will reserve points of order. Uh, uh, designate it's Amendment Three. Amendment offered by Mr. Shays to the amendment in nature is substitute at the end of Chapter Three of Subtitle H of Title Five. Add the following: availability to public and uh, service. Uh, if I could. With that, the clerk will dispense with the reading. Gentlemen, recognized. Thank you. Uh, th this simply uh, uh, provides for the declassification of the top line of the intelligence budget. It doesn't break out the various parts, but it it will allow the general public to know what all our adversaries know, what the bottom the line is on our budget, and it will enable us not to have to distort our budgets, try to hide things in different departments. That uh, actually the money isn't going for those things. Uh, it's a way to try to hide tens of billions of dollars of expenditure. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that um, we would declassify the, the, the top line of the intelligence budget as is recommended by the Commission. Um, once again, I say the gentleman's amendment addresses a subject matter that's not within the jurisdiction of this committee. That's within the jurisdiction of the Intelligence Committee. And under House Rule 16, Clause 7, it's not germane to consider amendments that aren't within the committee's jurisdiction, so uh, the amendment is not in order. Okay. Um, let me just ask, Mrs. Watson had an amendment that we will handle after the break, Ms. Watson. I, I, is the colloquy ready now? If we can, uh, Ms. Watson, uh, if you can just bear with me for one minute, if we, if we can take care of it now, I'll be happy to yeah. before we recess. It will be the Chair's intention in, in consultation with Mr. Waxman to recess uh, the markup in a couple minutes and to come back at 2.30. This will allow members to get over to the floor. It will allow p witnesses and, uh, I mean, uh, some of the audience here and members to get some lunch and to attend to other matters. Um, and uh, Mr. Sounders' bill is up on the floor as we speak. Uh, I do have a uh, colloquy here. Um, okay, a gentle ladies recognize Ms. Watson. Very quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you would agree to hold hearings to review personnel management policies of the NID, 
and the effectiveness of those policies in utilizing the talents of all personnel in national intelligence community. I think I could withdraw my amendment because I believe this language is inherent in the bill as written. And uh, we have talked to your staff and uh, we would further like you to agree to request testimony for appropriate witnesses from the office of the NID and NCTC. And uh, I think this would address my concern about diversity in uh, hiring well, of new personnel. I, I will agree to that, uh, Ms. Watson, the, the, uh, to get witnesses from the, the NID or the NCTC as to the mechanisms established for achieving the best pop possible human resources management. And you have my commitment that this, uh, assuming, well, we, we don't have to wait until, uh, out, out of, until next year, that we can move forward with this as soon as this is set up, as soon as it's practical, and you have our commitment to do that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I then withdraw my amendment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Maloney. I have an amendment at the desk, uh, the maloney Ruppersberger Amendment on Homeland Security Funding. Chair reserves a point of order. Clerk will report. They don't have it at the I don't desk. have the amendment. You don't have the amendment? It's on its way. Amendment offered by Mrs. Maloney to the amendment in the nature of substitute. Page and line numbers reference to HR. Move to dispense with the reading. Uh, gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. The chair has reserved a point of order. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, my amendment uh, regarding uh, Homeland Security funding, it follows directly the 9-11 Commission reports recommendations that, and I quote, Homeland Security assistance should be based strictly on assessment of risks and vulnerabilities. And we do know that Washington and New York are certainly at the top of such a list. But federal Homeland Security assistance has not reflected that, and it has become a program for general revenue sharing, in other words, pork barrel, uh, that is, is not correct. And this, uh, this uh, amendment would uh, change that formula. Currently, the Homeland Security funding is not distributed based on threat. Low-risk states top the list of per capita homeland money allocated, while the highest threat states are at the bottom. In the 2004 round of grants, Wyoming received over $38, California received only roughly $5, and New York roughly $5. Uh, obviously, there's more of a threat in New York and California uh, than Wyoming. Uh, so this uh, formula is not a fair one. Also, in the last budget, aid to the city of New York for high threat was cut by 69%, clearly not reflecting uh, where the threat is. A main reason uh, for the misguided uh, use of these funds is the minimum uh, guaranteed to each state regardless of Homeland Security needs. H.R. 10 has language guaranteeing money to each state, but not guaranteeing aid to high threat areas. And so my amendment would check it, would, would change that. The maloney Rupersburg Amendment would do away with the minimum to each state, adhering to the 9-11 Commission's recommendation that money be distributed based on risk, period. It seeks to guarantee that money go to the areas specifically named in intelligence reports as targets for terrorism. And uh, it's one of the most fundamental recommendations well, of the 141. Yield? Yes, I yield to the gentleman from Connecticut. And just very quickly, I know the chairman has to go to the floor, but just to say that our National Security Subcommittee uh, has had an, a number of hearings on this issue, as has the Select Committee, and has pointed out that we are wasting valuable resources and endangering uh, our populace because we are not doing it based on risk. And uh, I fully support her amendment and appreciate that mm -hmm. she offered it. Let the chair say, the um, chair is prepared to rule. First of all, Ms. Maloney, I, I support your amendment. Um, if we, uh, but it's out of order. Um, if we're able to offer this in the House floor, I'd love to have my name associated with uh, what you're trying to do here. This is the right approach. It's the cost-effective approach. It shows what happens sometimes when these things go to Congress and the sausage making that goes on, and it's mm -hmm. a political grab bag, and it's, it's unfortunate for your high-risk areas. Um, but the amendment does amend portions of the bill that aren't within our jurisdiction, unfortunately. So pursuant to House Rule 12, uh, 
uh, the Speaker has referred for our consideration only those portions of the bill that are within our jurisdiction, and the amendment, therefore, is not in order. Uh, Respectfully, but, Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I would ask your, your, your uh, staff to review this because we have had hearings from Mr. Rudman on, on, uh, on this subject, Mr. Gilmore on the subject, mm -hmm. the 9 11 Commission members right. on the subject of high threat money. Well, let me say to my friend, we have oversight over everything, but that's different than jurisdiction. Um, but I will join her in a letter to the Rules Committee asking that this be made considered in order. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we ought to have this vote. Maybe we can revisit this at the Appropriations Panel. Uh, next year, uh, but I certainly agree with her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. The chair will uh, declare a recess uh, until 2.30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk labeled number one, which uh, I plan to introduce and, and subsequently report withdraw. Amendment offered by Mr. Platts to the amendment in the nature of substitute HR 10. Page 104 after line seven, 17 insert the following. I dispense uh, with the reading. Uh, gentleman uh, is recognized for five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief Financial Officers play a key role in the management of federal agencies. They were created by Congress and have a unique fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayer. As we look at Section 5044 of Section 5 in this legislation, I'd like to ensure that CFOs are not considered when agencies make their recommendations to the President on which positions should no longer require Senate confirmation. I appreciate the need to mitigate the delay caused by the cumbersome Senate confirmation process. Clearly, when the system causes unnecessary delay and undermines our national security, it's important to focus on allowing qualified individuals to serve as quickly as possible. It's also important, however, that we balance constitutional congressional prerogative with expedience. The standing of the CFO was a key consideration as the Congress was debating the statutory underpinning for this position, the CFO Act. Congress deliberately placed the CFO in the top echelon of the agency management structure. Senate confirmation ensures accountability to the Congress and is an indicator of standing and influence both internally and externally regarding the federal government. Senate confirmation has its roots in Article II of the Confir uh, Constitution, requiring that a president seek the advice and consent of the Senate, consent of the Senate for the confirmation of officers, officers of the United States is a means to maintaining the balance of power between the legislative and executive branches. As you're well aware, the Constitution gives the Senate the prerogative to confirm all presidential appointments other than inferior officers. No reasonable person would argue that a CFO should be considered an inferior officer. And I hope that as agencies look to respond to this provision, they will keep this in mind. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency and Financial Management, I've spent the past 18 months working with experts in the public sector management field. I know firsthand how important this position is within the agency management structure, and I hope that we will not see CFOs uh, removed from the confirmation process. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Platts. Certainly you've been a champion of maintaining the CFO's uh, importance uh, within the organizations, and um, we recognize uh, how important they are. Uh, as you know, this takes a very broad base that everybody doesn't take out the CFOs, CIOs, CAOs, uh, and we'll get the report back. But when it comes back, uh, I look forward to you and make sure that CFOs are appropriately maintained uh, within the agency management structure. And I, I'll be happy to work with you at that point. So thank, thank you, you Mr. Much. Chairman. I, I look forward to that continued dialogue uh, when that report does come back and, and uh, working to ensure the integrity of the CFOs. Thank you. Do you have another amendment? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Do you, do you withdraw that amendment? Uh, I withdraw uh, amendment number Without one. objection, so order. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Uh, have an amendment at the desk labeled number three. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 10. At the end of Title V, add the following new section. Section 5034, Chief Financial Officers of Move the Office. to dispense with the reading. Uh, the uh, gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment uh, I had planned to offer today would have established the position of Chief Financial Officer in the Office of the National Intelligence Director and applied the provisions of the 1990 CFO Act to this office. What is important is the spirit of my amendment, which is to ensure financial accountability at the NID. The NID will have budgetary authority over a significant portion of U.S. intelligence activities. It is critical that we have a structure in place to effectively manage the billions of tax dollars this office will oversee. Also, the classified nature of the information used by this office further increases the need for a high-level financial leader. We will depend on this individual to ensure the accountability of financial management in an area with limited oversight. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Financial Management, one of the things I've seen time and time again is the inherent challenge in coordinating numerous component agencies, as will be the case with the new NID. It is imperative that we learn from the experience of other departments, such as the Department of Defense, NASA, the Department of Homeland Security, by ensuring that we have a strong financial leader who will provide accountability. If we are to grant the NID significant budget authority, we must also have a structure to ensure financial accountability. To accomplish this, I would like to uh, work with you on a commitment to join with me in co-sponsoring an amendment to H.R. 10 once we get to the floor uh, in Title I uh, and to work with the Rules Committee to ensure that this uh, amendment will be made in order. Uh, this amendment would establish a Deputy National Intelligence Director for Finance. This position would be appointed by and report directly to the National Intelligence Director. This individual will be the Senior Financial Manager, manager for the Office of the NID. Uh, and would carry out such duties as are necessary to ensure financial accountability. Well, you have my commitment uh, that I will work with you to try to get this to the floor, to co-sponsor with you, and try to get this to vote in the floor with you. If we're unable to do that, because I can't deliver on that, although I think there's a, a decent shot of doing that, uh, will we still have the conference. I look, I'll work with the gentleman at that point. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate that commitment. and. Uh, uh, am uh, optimistic of your persuasive powers that we will uh, be able to have the amendment in order or in conference achieve this important good government uh, effort. And uh, again, thanks for your efforts. I thank the, the uh, gentleman. The amendment's withdrawn. Yes, please. Uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Howen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got an amendment at the desk. All right. Uh, which amendment? Uh, this is amendment number one with, res with respect to information sharing. Okay. Amendment offered by Mr. Van Hollen to the amendment in the nature of substitute. At the end of Chapter 3 of Subtitle H of Title 5, add the following. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask you. Gentleman is, uh, the the uh, reading is dispensed with. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the major findings of the 9 11 uh, Commission uh, was that we did not have enough information sharing within the United States uh, government. And they have a whole section in their recommendations. Uh, that's devoted to the question of unity of effort in sharing information. And that's what this amendment that I offer together with uh, Mr. Tierney and Mr. Lynch uh, addresses. And it borrows from the legislation that has been introduced on, on the Senate side, the Collins-Lieberman uh, uh, legislation, with one exception that I'll mention in a moment. But the major thrust uh, of this legislation is to require the president to establish an information sharing network so that we make sure all those who are involved in the collection and analysis of intelligence in the United States government are sharing information with one another so we eliminate the problems of st with the stovepipes where one agency may have information that if another agency had it, it could put together a piece of the puzzle and see the overall portrait, uh, but because everybody is guarding information so jealously, uh, they're not able to share it and they're not able to use that information for the benefit of the protection of the American people. And so that's what this legislation would do. It would, number one, establish an information sharing network. It would require the issuance of guidelines and create incentives for information sharing. Uh, it would require the president uh, to submit a plan uh, to the Congress uh, that outlines the, 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 his, his plan for creating this information uh, sharing network. Uh, it creates an executive council and an advisory board that helps uh, OMB and the president 
uh, in developing the guidelines and the architecture for this uh, network. Uh, it, now, there is one difference between this amendment and the version that's offered on the Senate side, and that d d relates to uh, a provision in this amendment that does establish a board with the specific purpose of oversight of the information sharing network. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, the, the Senate uh, legislation has the overall board, uh, similar to the amendment that uh, Ms. McCollum in this committee offered, that would deal with the protection of privacy and, and civil liberties government-wide. Uh, if Ms. McCollum's amendment is accepted, th this part of this amendment would not be necessary. But in the event it's not accepted, we thought it was important that, especially with respect to information sharing, there be some oversight uh, mechanism to ensure the protection of civil liberties. And the 9-11 Commission specifically raised that issue in the context of information uh, sharing in their report. Uh, their report uh, says, for example, as the President determines the guidelines for information sharing among government agencies and by those agencies with the private sector, he should safeguard the privacy of individuals about whom, uh, about whom information uh, is shared. Uh, so this amendment provides for the sharing of information that is essential uh, for national security purposes and also has a provision in it that would create this oversight board to ensure uh, that we are looking out for the civil liberties and privacy of American citizens in the process. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me just say from, from my perspective, uh, uh, this is essentially the same debate we had concerning the creation of a government-wide civil liberties board. Um, having said that, uh, the provisions, uh, most of the provisions of this I really like. I like your information sharing uh, language on that. I, I just think that the creation of a civil liberties and privacy board uh, are going to add an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy. Remember, this is not a policy-making board. At the end of the day, this is a, an information gathering, collating board that's going to be uh, sharing it and making sure that happens. And uh, you know, I recognize the importance of safeguarding privacy concerns. You have that downstream with some of the other agencies as that information moves up. So I, I would, I'm going to oppose the amendment as written because of the uh, Civil Liberties Board uh, that you have included in that. Without that, uh, I think you have a, a great amendment, and I'm, I would like to find a way to take the language uh, from my perspective. Gentlemen's recognized. I yield to the gentleman. I th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, in the event that this amendment in its current form is not accepted, I also have a, an amendment that does not have this provision in it. Uh, I do think it's critical that we have the sharing of information among government agencies. I understand there's agreement on that. Uh, so in the event that this amendment is not offered, I have another amendment at the desk that I would also offer. Uh, well, why don't we vote this and then uh, if uh, if, if in the sequence it doesn't happen, we can have uh, your uh, other amendment. If not, we'll drop it. Is that agreement? I'm sorry. What we'll do is we will vote this amendment now, and then when we come to the rolling of the votes, we'll vote this amendment. Uh, if this amendment fails, we will call up your amendment. You can call up your amendment number two. Okay. And if amendment number one passes, we won't have to do uh, number two. Very good. I mean, we could do it, but I just think uh, so. Uh, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No, bring the chair the nose have it. Yes, we'll roll call on that or ask for a roll call, Mr. Okay, we'll roll this vote and uh, the gentleman from Maryland's recognized. You want to call up your second amendment now? Well, let me just ask you, Mr. Chairman, the, the second amendment on this ish information sharing issue? Absolutely. Okay. Now, w what yeah. happens is if number one prevails, we vote. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I offer this amendment with um, Mr. Tierney and, and Mr. Lynch. This amendment is identical to the one we were just talking about, except it does not contain, uh, does not create a separate board for the oh, oversight excuse, of Excuse me liberties. just a second. Um, the staff has given me the look. Do you have a copy of the amendment? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, amendment read. offered by Mr. Van Holland to the amendment. Move to dispense with the reading. Amendment's called up. I'm sorry. Ms. Van Holland, you're re recognized for five minutes. Right. I, I We're getting ahead of ourselves. We, we got uh, the script, but we have to go through the formalities. Exactly. Go ahead. Uh, again, I, I, thank, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do think uh, it's critical that we adopt the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission uh, with respect to information sharing uh, in the United States government. If you look at their report, there are numerous examples where the failure to share information uh, between and among different agencies uh, has created uh, problems uh, for the national security of the American people. And what, what this legislation uh, would do is require a, a uh, 
uh, report to be submitted by the President of the United States uh, after consulting with an advisory board and the, an executive council that's established pursuant to the amendment uh, that provides a, a mechanism for the sharing of that information. Uh, this amendment is essentially identical to the language that uh, is on the Senate side that's been submitted uh, by Senators Collins and, and Lieberman, uh, and I would urge the adoption of this amendment. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Maloney. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I also would like to speak uh, very uh, strongly in support of uh, the gentleman's um, amendment, Mr. Van Hollens, and it is absolutely identical not only to the Collins-Lieberman legislation, but the bill that Mr. Shays and I have introduced in the House. Uh, one of the core recommendations of the 9-11 Commission was that the need to know culture had to be replaced with the need to share. And they gave one example after another. Specifically on page uh, 394 is the recommendation from the Commission uh, that uh, highlights this as one of the very important uh, aspects of the bill that, that should be going forward in response to the 9-11 Commission. I, I recall testimony in this room, there were so many hearings, I believe it was this room, where one of the Commission members testified that they went to see the head of the CIA, asked them if they knew about the, the terrorists uh, that, uh, that boarded the planes, if they knew about Massari, and, they, and he said yes. And uh, did they share that information with the FBI? No. What did you do about it? Well, it's not my problem, it's their problem. Well, we have to do something about it. When information is out there that could protect Americans, that you could put the dots together that, that would make America safer, uh, we have got to, to change. And uh, the language in, in the Republican bill, H.R. 10, has very weak provisions requiring uh, the establishment of, and I quote, uniform security standards and procedures and common IT standards, protocols, and interfaces for existing information um, systems. It does not have the language that requires the sharing that uh, is in the Collins uh, uh, legislation, the maloney Shays legislation. And I might add that this language and this amendment has been endorsed by the Commission members in a bipartisan way. The 9-11 families, um, even the President of the United States endorsed the Collins-Lieberman bill. And I would suggest that this committee strongly support this amendment that is one of the main recommendations coming out of the 9-11 Commission report. And I yield my balance of my time to Mr. Van Hollen to make further statements if he feels it's necessary. It's just, uh, this is bipartisan language. It was developed in the Senate and incorporated in, in, in this amendment, and it includes provisions designed to promote privacy protections, which is tremendously important in the new information sharing network. So I strongly support Don't it, and I yield to Mr. Mr. Van Hollen. I thank my colleague, and I want to thank her uh, for all her leadership uh, on this issue, along with uh, Mr. Shays and others. Uh, and uh, she has been an uh, important leader in the House uh, on these issues um, from the very start. I, I would just emphasize the fact that the uh, testimony before this committee from Mr. Lehman uh, and, and former Senator uh, Kerry uh, as representatives of the 9-11 Commission emphasized the importance of information sharing and the importance of including uh, something like this provision uh, in the legislation. I just quote from their joint uh, testimony, uh, agencies live now by the, quote, need to know rule, unquote, and refuse to share. Each agency has its own computer system and its own security practices, outgrowths of the Cold War. In the 9-11 story, we came to understand the huge costs of failing to share information across agency boundaries. And they go on and talk about uh, the critical importance of information sharing. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I think this is an area where there should be bipartisan consensus well, on this committee. There certainly was bipartisan consensus. In fact, unanimous uh, support on the 9-11 Commission. Well, uh, gentlemen, yield I, for I, one second. I, I would yeah. like to request unanimous uh, approval to place in the record this particular recommendation verbatim from the 9-11 Commission report uh, that uh, Mr. Van Hollen's uh, amendment uh, totally and completely mirrors. What, what, give us the page in reference and we'll put it in the report. It's uh, page uh, 394. 
and also relevant testimony from other committees on this importance Thank and the t Without testimony objection. before this committee. Without objection. Mr. Tierney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, happy to join Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Lynch in offering this amendment and, and take a different aspect of it, uh, if I may, because I think they've made the case uh, generally. When Chairman Keene was in front of this committee back on August 17th, uh, it actually was uh, the quote that Mr. Van Hollen read pretty much covered what he said, but one of the things he talked about was the 9-11 story that we came to understand the huge cost of failing to share information across agency boundaries yet the current practices of government security practices encourage overclassification. And I think with respect to overclassification, on that point he is exactly correct. According to the National Ar Archives and Records Administration, uh, in year, fiscal years 2001 to 2003, the annual average of original classifications increased 50 percent over the averages for the previous five fiscal years. Fourteen million classification actions were reported last year alone and the total number of pages declassified was the lowest in the last 10 years by this administration. Now, the National Security Subcommittee held a hearing on this issue last month. Uh, that when asked by Mr. Shays what percentage of information was overclassified, the Defense Department's own witness admitted that it was 50 percent. That should be a little incomprehensible to all of us. As some on this committee know, uh, I've been critical in the past of the Pentagon's recent decision to retroactively classify all of the previously open and available information related to National Missile Defense recommendations of the former Director of Operations and Evaluation and Testing. None of them were previously classified. All of the information was in the public domain for four years or more, and yet because there was a critical report of the National Missile Defense System out, the administration classified the report and then went back and classified previously available materials. We have to address the Commission's strong and unequivocal recommendations that the executive branch move from treating information on a need to know to a need to share basis. I don't know that, uh, that there can be more overemphasis on classification uh, than they were made in that statement and those testimonies by different people. If we're going to have congressional oversight, if we're in fact going to do our job, if the public is going to have a transparent process, they should be able to see all those things that should not be classified. And if we're overclassifying by 50 percent, that's a lot of information that the public ought to have in their hands to determine whether or not the right actions are being taken with regard to making them safe and whether or not we're spending the taxpayers' money appropriately. This can't happen without the language in there on, on information sharing uh, that's in this uh, amendment. Simply speaking, we ask that as soon as possible, but in no event later than 180 days after the date of the enactment of the act, the President, in consultation with the Executive Council, uh, issue guidelines on classification policy and handling procedures across federal agencies, including commonly accepted processing and access controls, and that they reduce disincentives to information sharing, including overclassification. These are things that this committee ought to be united behind to make sure that we're able to do our job and that the people in this country are able to see the things they ought to see, that it should be in the public domain uh, and help them make judgments about whether or not their legislature and their executive are doing the jobs that should be done. Uh, this amendment simply would replace the House language with stronger language from the Collins-Lieberman bill. It tracks the Commission recommendations and the Markle Foundation standards more closely. For example, the amendment directs the President to establish a sharing network, issue guidelines for information sharing, create incentives for data sharing, and submit an architecture uh, for doing that, and an implementation plan as well. It designates an Office of Management Budget official to carry out the information sharing duties, creates an Executive Council on Information Sharing to assist the Office of Management Budget, and an Advisory Board on Information Sharing to advise the President and the Executive Council on policy, technical, and management issues related to the design and operation of the network. Mr. Chairman, I urge the Committee's approval of this critical amendment uh, and hope that we'll have your agreement in doing that. Yield back. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to support the amendment. The 9-11 Commission report made clear what this committee already knew, that there's a lack of information sharing and analysis among the relevant public and private sector uh, parties. We need to move uh, from a culture of need to know uh, to need to share. Uh, this amendment's based on Collins uh, Lieberman Bill S-2845, uh, which requires the President establish a trusted information network and secure information sharing environment to promote sharing of intelligence and homeland security information. Under the amendment, these responsibilities are given to the Office of Management and Budget, <coughs> the entity that already has statutory responsibility for federal information policy 
And the amendment clearly mirrors revised language which we drafted for the speaker's package but was later dropped by leadership. So I agree uh, with the concept of clarifying and enhancing OMB's federal information policy role, especially with regards to establishing a government-wide network, and I encourage members to support uh, Van Hollen Amendment uh, Number 2. Anyone else all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Passes, but we'll go to a, a, a roll call on that. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I had an amendment that had been pending, and I want to uh, bring it up again. The gentleman is uh, recognized. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Waxman to, to the amendment in the nature of the substitute to H.R. 10. Strike Chapter 1 of subsection. I ask unanimous consent the amendment be considered as read. Without objection. The reading, um, readings waived. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Commission recommended that the nation minimize as much as possible the disruption of national security policy making during the change of administrations by accelerating the process for national security appointments. In order to achieve quicker appointments, it recommends that the presidential candidates submit the names quickly and the Senate review those names quickly. In addition, the Commission recommended that the outgoing administration provide the president elect with a catalog of specific operational threats to national security, major military or covert operations, and pending decisions on the possible use of force. The Senate language implements these recommendations. My language is the bipartisan Senate language. H.R. 10 has extraneous provisions that deviate from the Commission's recommendations. I mentioned the most egregious provision before we recessed. Under this bill, nominees and sitting senior officials would not have to disclose their assets or income worth $5 million, $25 million, even $50 million. In addition, under H.R. 10, the President does not have to follow current law requiring vacancies to be filled by an acting officer who has worked at the agency for 90 days and is at least a GS-15. This means the President does not need anyone with any background or expertise. He can hire a friend or someone off the street. This, is, this is, uh, too, is extraneous. I want to address um, uh, the discussions we were having prior to the committee recessing. The chairman pointed out that uh, my amendment strikes language in H.R. 10 requiring Senate confirmation to occur within 30 days. What was failed to be mentioned, however, is that H.R. 10 also states that if a confirmation does not occur, that person is confirmed anyway. We should not get rid of Senate confirmation. Congressional oversight is crucial. These nominees are very senior national security officials, nor should we in the House take away a right of the Senate. That is why my amendment calls on the Senate to perform confirmation in 30 days, but also ensures that confirmation must still occur. So we would try to accelerate the, uh, the discussion and confirmation process, but not to eliminate it as a penalty for the Senate not acting within a certain lim uh, limited period of time. Some may argue that we ought to have um, changes in the conflict of interest financial disclosure rules. Well, perhaps so, but we really haven't discussed it. There was a proposal in the Senate, as I understood it, uh, made by Senator Thompson uh, that would have accomplished this, and the chairman has even said Common Cause supported it. Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but even if they did, we haven't had discussions about it. Why should it be in this bill? Why not try to address that issue in an in a, uh, overall bill dealing with uh, personnel issues? But to single out people in this particular area for the, uh, hiding their, the, the amount of their assets in a financial disclosure does not make any sense to me. I think it's extraneous to the bill. And so uh, I, I certainly would want to strike the provision which my amendment would do, dealing with the financial disclosure uh, requirements. So that, that's the sum and substance of the amendment, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, put well, it thank you. And, and I appreciate your meeting with us over the break to see if we could work out uh, something. Uh, we talked about the time periods which currently, if the Senate fails to act on a key appointment in these areas uh, after 30 legislative days, this is the underlying bill. Um, that appointment uh, all of a sudden uh, is, is ratified and that person can take office. One of the problems identified in the 9-11 Commission report 
uh, was the fact that uh, we couldn't get our people in place. Some of it was due to disclosure and vetting. Some of it was due to the fact that uh, they couldn't get these people to the floor. Uh, there are holds over there on the Senate. Uh, I don't think there's a major dispute between us on that issue, except that our legislation calls for 30 days and, and uh, th th this legislation undoes that. The larger problem is the disclosure issue. Our, we believe that disclosure really is all about uh, conflicts of interest. We don't think it ought to be uh, going into people's incomes that have nothing to do with uh, conflict of interests. Uh, really, what somebody makes or their income is, in my opinion, not everybody's business just because somebody goes into government. One of the problems we've had are getting good, qualified people from the private sector into government is that their whole life becomes transparent. It's held up there. If it has something to do with conflict of interest, we ought to know about it. It ought to be flagged. It ought to be consideration in terms of somebody getting qualified. But if it doesn't, why are we putting it through it? It's just a deterrent to good people coming into government. This was based on a bill uh, authored by Senator Thompson from uh, Tennessee. Uh, we had testimony here uh, in the Senate uh, and the other body on this issue. Uh, the Common Cause supported that legislation. And uh, the, the proposed amendment goes further than that and I think makes this uh, a matter of, di of disclosing things that really aren't relevant to what it ought to be, and that's um, uh, conflicts of interest. So I'm going to oppose the amendment, but I appreciate the gentleman trying to work something out with us on this. We weren't able to, and I think the committee's going to have to vote it up or down. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to. Thank you very much for yielding to me. I'm sorry we haven't been able to reach an agreement on this. But let, let's step back for a minute and recognize an, an appointment by the president would be automatically considered in place even without Senate, Senate confirmation, even if the background checks had not come back, even if that had been the delay. Now, the 9-11 Commission wanted to invigorate Congress to act faster, but this, in effect, I think, takes away the right of the Senate, which is half the Congress, to do uh, the confirmation, which is a check. And I think this bill, in a number of areas, takes away the checks that Congress should have on, on the President. We, in this bill, not on the amendment we're discussing, but elsewhere, allow the president to rewrite the laws and send to the Congress for simply an up or down vote. The president can uh, appoint people before the background checks are even finished. They're confirmed. There are no requirements for inspectors general. And if there's no inspector general, that means there isn't that check that we have through the IG law, which I think you and well, I have championed over me, the years. Let me just say to my friend, if this was the problem, uh, we could work the 30 days uh, giving when all the background checks. That that's not that should not be an issue, and that's something that could be worked out. I don't think that's going to satisfy the gentleman. I think he has other concerns on disclosure that are not surmountable. Certainly, the time periods are something that we'll be flexible on. But I think our larger issue is on what is what should be the nature of these disclosures at this point. Well, I I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, that I am troubled even about the basic idea of taking away the confirmation from the Senate. But I, I am even more troubled that something as extraneous as financial disclosure is brought into this bill, and if it's good enough for people in the, in the intelligence area, it ought to be good enough for other federal employees. And I think we ought to think that one through more carefully before we start uh, adopting into law for one area and not others. So I, I, I guess we have to come to the uh, realization that we ha do not have a meeting of the minds between you and I on this proposal. And, I think yeah. my proposal is uh, what we ought to have in the bill, so I, uh, I respectfully offer it to the members of the I committee and ask for the consideration. Mr. Chairman, will the, will, will well, the... Well, let me just say I kind of like my proposal better, mm -hmm. Mr. Wyatt. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Well, let, Chairman... Let me, let me just finish. Okay. But, but that's really what this is about. I, I, I think there, we, we are focusing on this because the 9-11 Commission report uh, talked about how long and difficult it was for the administration to get their people in place. They'd been in office three months before they got their people in key intelligence areas in place. That hinders national security. All we're saying in these cases is 30 days, 30 legislative days, up or down, and if the Senate can't get their act together during that time, these people become appointed and they're in place so the administration can proceed to protect the homeland. You know how this situation works. You get senators who have a hold or they have a grudge on somebody else or they're playing politics, and nobody gets in that position. And when it comes to our intelligence and homeland security, mm -hmm. that shouldn't happen. 30 days is plenty of time to vet this. 30 legislative days, mm -hmm. which can often be two, three months. This is plenty of time to vet these, to hold the hearings, and to get it mm -hmm. to the floor for an up or down vote. That's all we're asking. Mm -hmm. The alternative 
is that these positions go unfilled in key intelligence positions, and that's why we treat it differently. And as I said, I, I understand the gentleman's concern. He's, I think, articulated it well. And we just have a, have a disagreement. Just a, uh, one, uh, one uh, sure. more, if the gentleman just would permit. Uh, this president, particularly, and other presidents have appointed people who are quite controversial. I can imagine President Bush, uh, if he's reelected, submitting a name, and they might realize they'd have trouble with that particular appointee. Senator Frist, at his request, could withhold it from consideration by the Senate, and then the uh, individual would go right into a place. Could you imagine what would happen if we extended this to the courts? The Senate well, would lose the ability to debate and consider what, uh, a constitutional prerogative. So I think we do have that. Well, we do, but, but understand, the Senate doesn't lose any ability. They got 30 days. They have the ability to vote it down. That, that's what they have. They can vote the thing down if they don't like him, instead of just holding it in abeyance and hoping it will go away because somebody's got a grudge and has registered something, which is often the case. It's usually not the controversy of the nominee, except maybe with one or two people. And sometimes, frankly, it's just the inertia of the other body that was well documented in Robert Caro's book, Master of the Senate, where he basically says it's been a dysfunctional body for 100 years. And you see it no other place better than in some of these appointments in these areas. But I understand the gentleman's concern, and I think it's, uh, you know, the uh, members will be able to vote on it in a few minutes. Ms. Maloney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would uh, like to underscore my support for the ranking member's amendment and to also uh, underline that his language is the exact language that's in the Collins-Lieberman bill in the Senate. It's also the language that the 9-11 Commission members in a bipartisan way have endorsed. It's the language that has been introduced in this body in the Shays-Maloney bill, and it's the language that is supported by the 9-11 families and the Commission members. And uh, for the reasons that were put forward, I, I think it's important uh, that we stay true to the core purpose and recommendations of the Commission on page 422, and I'd like to put them in the record, and they support the, the gentleman, the ranking member's uh, amendment. I yield uh, my remaining time back to the ranking member if he would like any more time. Mr. Mr. Waxman, she's yielded you any time should you require it on this. Thank you. Yeah, no, okay, thank you very much. I think we're almost ready, but I just want to make one point, if I can have that. You want to voice vote that one? Uh, uh, yeah, I want to make one comment. Just, I'm not sure it's going to change anybody's mind, but at least get it on the, on the record. Can I? Yeah, I lost, got so many notebooks here. It's, Let me say to my friend from New York, just in terms of what's in the 9-11 report or not, on page 422 of the report, the um, commission notes that the Bush administration did not have its cabinet officers and, and, and some of the lesser officers in place until the spring of 2001, and the critical sub-candidate officials were not confirmed until the summer, if then. In other words, the new administration, like others before it, did not have its team on the job until at least six months after it took office. Since the recommendation, since a catastrophic attack could occur with little or no notice, we should minimize as much as possible the disruption of national security policymaking during the change of administrations by accelerating the process for national security appointments. We think the process could be improved significantly so transitions can work more effectively and allow new officials to assume their new responsibilities as quickly as possible. That's from the 9-11 Commission report. That's what we've done in this legislation here. That's what this amendment undoes. So when you talk about being true to the 9-11 Commission report, I think the underlying legislation that we've introduced does that. I think this amendment guts it. Questions on the amendment of the gentleman from California? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. And the no's have it. You would like a vote on that, Mr. <laughs> Wax? My no was louder. Um, are there other amendments at this point? Mr. Van Hollen, do you have one more? Yes, oh, let, uh, I think, let me look over here. Mr. Duncan, do you have an amendment? And I'll get back. Yes, sir. Uh, Just have a couple more, and hopefully Mr. we'll Chairman, be voting it. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly appreciate the hard work that you and the staff have done on this uh, 
bill and, and you do many, many good things in this legislation. I have a concern though about a particular section, section 5052. All right, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Duncan to the amendment in the nature of substitute to HR 10. Page 107, strike lines 20 through 25 and insert the following. Shall not exceed the lesser of A, 50% of the annual rate of basic pay of the employee as the beginning of the period of service established under subsection B or B, 25% of such annual rate. Move, uh, we can move dispense with the reading. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right now, the bill allows a 50% uh, bonus for uh, multiplied by the number of years that an employee agrees to stay on. Uh, three or four years ago, the Postal Service got into a major scandal because they had given out bonuses totaling $100,000 and $200,000 in a lot of cases and uh, relocation uh, payments of um, over $100,000 in some cases. This uh, bill, uh, I think, uh, opens up potentially scandalous uh, uh, type of uh, bonuses, and I think that if we leave it in as is, we uh, certainly can't uh, call this a fiscally conservative bill because uh, right now uh, every employee in the FBI would be eligible to receive uh, uh, some type of uh, this uh, bonus. And for instance, an employee who's making $100,000 a year could uh, receive a bonus of $200,000 if they agreed to uh, stay on for uh, four years. So uh, what I've done, I've offered an amendment that would be a very minimal, I, in fact, I think the bonuses should be restricted even more than this, but what my amendment says is that no uh, employee can receive a bonus exceeding 25% of his or her annual salary uh, and, and at no uh, time could it be multiplied uh, by more than two or, or uh, could never exceed more than 50% of their total salary. In addition, another important limitation I put in this is that these bonuses could not be given to more than 10% of the total number of FBI employees in any one year. Uh, the last time I saw figures on the FBI, and I think they've added employees since then, but it had like 27,000 employees. This uh, very minimal limitation would limit it to uh, 2,700 employees, and I don't think that's uh, asking for much at all. In fact, I really think that, that these bonuses should be restricted even more than what I'm asking for in my amendment, but I wanted to do it as minimally as I could uh, get by with. So that's, uh, that's what my amendment is about, and I hope that uh, at least some people will agree with me on this and support it. Uh, I appreciate the gentleman's remarks, and I, regretfully, I, I, I understand the thrust of them, but I can't support it, and let me just tell you why. Um, the amendment, as I understand it, wants to put a cap on the FBI's bonuses and salaries while the rest of the federal government is not hindered by this restriction. So basically what we're saying to our law enforcement officers, our FBI personnel, is you're not eligible for bonuses that are eligible in other parts of government. And I think that's the wrong direction. One of the problems we have right now is recruitment and retention of key personnel at the FBI, le at the FBI level. Now, Frank Wolf, the chairman of the CJS Appropriations uh, uh, Subcommittee, uh, in, in put a, this undoes what the House did on this earlier this year in reforming the FBI's personnel policies. Uh, those policies uh, put some, uh, frankly, g gave managers more flexibility over their workforce but it did allow uh, the, these bonuses. And I think if you want to revitalize the FBI, and even the 9-11 report acknowledges that it needs to be done, that this amendment uh, goes uh, the wrong uh, direction. I understand the gentleman's concern about how bonuses are paid and everything else, but the difficulty we have, given with the jurisdictional issues we face here today, is the only way the gentleman can get at it is to single out the FBI. So you end up with the FBI re-employing people or keeping people on who are eligible to retire, and they get less than somebody in any other government agency. I just think it's the wrong uh, signal uh, to send. The amendment also proposes to limit uh, the number of people that can take advantage of the flexibilities available in the bill. First, no other agency is subject to this. So basically, the law enforcement, the FBI, which is critical uh, to uh, following through in the 9-11 reports and intelligence gathering and homeland security, gets treated to a disadvantage over other agencies uh, of uh, government on this cap. Secondly, the money available for these flexibilities aren't limitless. Congress still has to appropriate the funds every year. And what I would suggest to my friend is that next year during the appropriations process is an appropriate time uh, to take this up. Uh, we can do it agency by agency. We can do it just for the FBI. 
Uh, the appropriations bill is where these limitations were raised this year. Uh, with uh, uh, Chairman Wolf working with the head of the FBI to try to give him the tools he could to recruit and retain key personnel in this fight. And I would hope that he would seek to do this next year through that process. Um, the cap for bonuses uh, 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 that we have, I might add, too, in the, our legislation here uh, that this undoes, we have the cap in the underlying legislation here that's in the Senate bill. For the, so for those of you who think the Senate bill is the Bible, this amendment would be the apocrypha because this undoes what the Senate has done uh, in this area as well. And I hope that's uh, persuasive to members. But well, I, appreci I appreciate the gentleman's concern, understand where he's coming from, and hope that we can revisit this in a more comprehensive way in, a, in another bill. I'd be happy to, to yield to the gentleman. Just very briefly, let me say, I understand your points, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and most respectfully, though, let me say that just because we're allowing uh, very excessive uh, bonuses to other uh, government agencies doesn't mean it that we should do. Doesn't mean to me that we should do it in this bill. We should do what we can in this bill. And in addition, even if my amendment was adopted, which I'm I'm sure that it won't be, but if it was, there still you still would be allowed that uh, 2,700 employees or so would could still get bonuses and right. and many of them or most of them could get very excessive bonuses so it still allows a huge number of very large bonuses i, under I understand you. and the gentleman's been consistent in raising these concerns not just on this and other legislation and so i i, I appreciate that uh, gentleman from california uh, mr uh, chairman and i want to particularly draw the attention to our colleague who's offered the amendment uh, our committee passed a bill and the senate also has passed a bill it's not yet law that would provide for 100 percent bonuses, which would include the FBI. Uh, you want to limit it to 50 percent in your amendment. The underlying bill has 200 percent. If your amendment doesn't pass, I would hope you'd consider supporting an amendment that I would like to author, or I'd support if you want to author it, to limit it to 100 percent. And then we put the FBI in the same place as everybody else and not put them at disadvantage if you go at 50 percent, which is lower than everyone else. I think 100 percent makes a lot, a lot of sense. So I just want to mention that to the gentleman. Hope he'll entertain uh, uh, consideration f uh, of, uh, of doing that. And if he'd like to, I'd join him in the uh, introduction of that amendment. Our difficulty, well, let me just ask uh, any other debate on this amendment. The question is on the gentleman's amendment. All in favor say aye. All opposed say no. No. Impeding the chair, the noes have it. We ask a roll call vote on that. Are there other amendments? Oh, Mr. Van Hollen, yes, I'm sorry. I think this may be the last amendment or close to it, and then we can, we, we may have um, votes on the House floor in 15 minutes, so I want to move as quickly as we can. Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment offered by Mr. Van Hollen to the amendment in the nature of the substitute to H.R. 10. Page 111, Move after Move to dispense with the reading. Gentlemen's recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. This amendment deals with a, a problem that was identified in the 9-11 uh, Commission uh, report with the respect to the lack of sufficient foreign language translation uh, capabilities within the United States government, the FBI, the CIA, uh, and other agencies. Uh, and I would just read from uh, page 77 of the 9-11 Commission report, uh, which reads, the FBI did not dedicate sufficient resources to the surveillance and translation needs of counterterrorism agents. It lacks sufficient translators proficient in Arabic and other key languages, resulting in a significant backlog of untranslated intercepts. Uh, and I would ask unanimous consent that a number of other excerpts from that report uh, re regarding um, lack of foreign language uh, capabilities be inserted in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, move, moving right along, uh, I'm just going to include something in the record, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could, um, from the 9-11 Commission report. Um, without objection. Th thank you. Uh, this problem has not been addressed uh, yet. There was a July 2004 uh, report from the Office of the Inspector General uh, at the FBI, and the declassified portions of that report uh, just became public. Uh, yesterday, there were reports in the Washington Post, New York Times, and some other newspapers about the continuing uh, backlog in documents uh, that require 
uh, translation. And it turns out the FBI has failed to translate hundreds of thousands of hours of wiretap recordings from counterterrorism, counterintelligence investigations since September 11th, uh, 2000 uh, in one. Uh, and the audit showed that the FBI's not meeting uh, FBI Director uh, Mueller's requirement that Al-Qaeda related audio recordings be translated within 12 hours. They're will, failing. The will the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Um, I read the same reports and, and was equally disturbed. I think the gentleman has put a good amendment uh, before us. Uh, this wasn't part of earlier drafts. This is just, as the gentleman said, just occurred in the last few days. Uh, I'm prepared to accept it from our uh, perspective. The gentleman's. I, I, I thank the chairman. I uh, look forward to uh, getting the report from the president that outlines uh, the, right. the resources we need to invest in this very important Questions area. on the gentleman's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the amendment is adopted. Mr. Waxman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. All right, here, give me that. I need that great. Yeah. No, amendment second, offered second. by Mr. Waxman on line 25 after word involved. In no event exceed 100% of the annual of basic pay of the employee at the beginning of, of the service period. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is. Uh, uh, somewhat along the lines of Mr. Duncan's uh, amendment, except we go up to 100 percent, which would put the FBI at the same place as uh, all other uh, federal employees that are entitled to bonuses. I think it makes sense. And should Mr. Duncan's be defeated, I would hope members would support this amendment. Okay. Uh, once again, this undoes what the House did uh, in the CJS conference report on something that uh, Congressman Wolf, who is not a member of this committee, had negotiated with the FBI and, and held hearings on, and, and as the majority we had supported. But uh, the gentleman's amendment is in order. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Just no. Uh, be, be, be the chair, have it. We'll have a roll call on that. It'll be a secondary. All right, the, um, are we ready to go? Are there other amendments? If there are no other amendments, well, let's try to move through. Uh, we, we have the last speaker on the floor right now. We have the last speaker on the floor right now. Chairman Young is speaking on this, is it the CR? On the continuing resolution. What I would like to do is recess and uh, we can print up what all the amendments are for everybody and have it printed. I'll work with Mr. Waxman to get it and then come back immediately after that vote and we'll be able to vote these in succession. Mr. Waxman, does that sound agreeable? I'm afraid if we start now um, and, the, and we, the bell goes off within a couple of minutes, it will be disruptive. And I want members to see what they're voting on. This will allow each side to make sure we list each of the amendments and a brief explanation. Well, it, uh, it's certainly reasonable, not quite fitting with my schedule for the rest of the day, but I don't see any other alternative, so I would certainly go along with your uh, suggestion. Well, it doesn't fit mine. Let me just say I was invited to be with the mayor for the uh, announcement on D.C. baseball at 5 o'clock, and it looks like I won't be well, there. I, was, but I, I don't want anybody to misinterpret that, that my priorities are out of whack. I was going to join Mr. There. Burton in a particular spot. <laughs> And Mr. Shays, perhaps, as well, downstairs in the Rayburn building, but we'll uh, do that later. <laughs> There'll be time. Uh, we will then recess. We'll have our committee staffs put together the explanation. And we'd like to convene this right after the vote, uh, if everyone could come back. Yeah, gentleman from uh, Tennessee. If I could ask a quick question. Sure. If the chairman would refresh my memory, when we voice voted the Cooper Amendment, yes. uh, it was my impression that the chairman had said something like, look, sounds like the ayes have it. In no way precluding a roll call vote. Well, I ask for a roll call. If you don't, I will ask for a roll call. So we're going to have a roll call on it. I but think I, I think you did have more people there. I, d I asked for a roll call. I'm reminded by the clerk. But, but it sounded like the eyes had it. They did it. They they did, they did at that point. But I'm not sure they have it now. Well, but we'll I, I understand that. I understand that, Mr. Chairman. But at the time, it sounded like the eyes had yeah, it. Yeah. Let the record so they had it at the time. But I had the right to request a roll call, and and now our members are back and. Uh, We'll be back uh, in about 15 minutes. So Thank you. we'll recess and uh, convene you right after votes. I'd urge everybody to get right back.
The uh, committee will come to order. Um, we have a number of pending votes. I hope that everybody has a copy of what's happening, but let me just add to try to save the committee time. We've reached an agreement concerning two of the pending amendments, Mr. Duncan's amendment and Mr. Waxman's third amendment, both of which concern FBI bonus pay. And uh, I ask unanimous consent that the Duncan Amendment be withdrawn and the committee adopt Mr. Waxman's Amendment Number 3. These are the last two on the list. Is there objection? Without objection, uh, so ordered. All right, we will start the voting first on an amendment offered by Mr. Cooper to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 10. Um, we divided this by unanimous consent. This regards additional officers of the Office of the National Intelligence uh, Director. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Davis. No. Votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays passes. Mr. Burton. Ms. Ross Layton. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Souter. Mr. LaTourette. Mr. Osi. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Deal. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Teaberry. Mr. T. Berry votes no. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kenjorski. Mr. Kenjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Rupersberger. Ms. Norton. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Micah. Mr. Souter. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Ver Murphy votes no. Mr. LaTourette. Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Owens. Mr. Clay. Mr. Rupersberger. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Tiberi. He's already recorded. Anyone else? Clerk will report. Mr. Davis, I have 17 ayes and 20 noes. The motions, uh, the amendment's defeated. We now move to an amendment offered by Mr. Tierney to the amendment in the nature of a substitute, striking the intelligence community reorganization plans. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Ross Layton. No. Mr. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. No. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. 
Mr. Mica votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Latourette. Mr. Latourette votes no. Mr. Osi. No. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. No. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Tberry. Mr. Tberry votes no. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Rupersberger. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Mr. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Any Mr. Owens. Mr. Ruppersberger. Any other members? Here's Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger. Aye. <laughs> Any other members? Clerk will report. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Davis, I have 20 ayes and 21 noes. Amendment is uh, defeated. We move now to the amendment offered by Mrs. McCollum to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes no. Ms. Ross Layton. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Latourette. Mr. Latourette votes no. Mr. Osi. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mrs. Miller. No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Turner. No. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. No. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Tberry. No. Mr. Tberry votes no. Ms. Harris. No. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. No. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Ms. Norton. Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Cooper. Aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye.
Any other members wish to vote? Clerk will report. Do I end the day and not voting? I'm putting one phase here. Pardon? Mr. Chairman, I have 20 ayes and 21 noes. Now move to the amendment offered by Mr. Deal. This shortens to one year the deadline for states to comply with driver's license reform. It's currently three years in the bill. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes no. Ms. Ross Layton. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Latourette. Mr. Latourette votes aye. Mr. Osi. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes aye. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Aye. Mr. Duncan votes aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes aye. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Turner. No. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. T. Berry. Mr. T. Berry votes aye. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Aye. Mr. Cantor votes aye. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Ms. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Rupersberger. Mr. Rupersberger votes no. Ms. Norton. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes no. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Ozy. Mr. Vo Ozy votes aye. Mr. Any? Murphy. Yeah. Mr. Murphy votes no. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded, please? Mr. Turner, you voted no. Uh, I'd like to record his aye, please. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Turner votes aye. Yes. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah, you voted no. Oh, I meant aye. I'm sorry. Mr. Micah votes aye. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. McHugh, you're voted no. Mr. McHugh votes aye. It counts the same whether it's a reluctance or not. Any other members wish to change their votes? <laughs> Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, I have 14 ayes and 28 noes. The amendment is uh, defeated. We now move to Amendment 2 offered by Mr. Waxman. This strikes the driver's license standard and replaces it with general directives. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Burton. No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Ms. Ross Layton. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. LaTourette. 
Mr. Latourette votes no. Mr. Osi. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Ms. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Tberry. Mr. Tberry votes no. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. <coughs> Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Rupersberger. Mr. Rupersberger votes aye. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Cooper. <coughs> Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. <coughs> Ms. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes no. Any other members wish to vote or change your votes? Clerk will report. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, there are 20 ayes and 21 noes. Amendment is uh, defeated. We now move to the um, Waxman Amendment, the nature of a substitute, Amendment 1. It strikes the streamlining the appointments process section. Clerk will call the roll. Clerk will get a glass of water. <laughs> Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Yes. Mr. Shays votes yes. Mr. Burden. No. Mr. Burden vo votes no. Ms. ross -Layton. No. Ms. ross -Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. La Tourette. Mr. La Tourette votes no. Mr. Osi. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Tberry. Mr. Tberry votes no. Ms. Harris. Mrs. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman? Vote aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson? Aye. Mrs. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen? Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Rupersberger? Aye. Mr. Rupersberger votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mrs. McCollum? Mrs. McCollum votes aye. Are there any members uh, wish to change your votes or have not recorded? If not, the uh, clerk will report. 
Mr. Chairman, there are 23 nays and 20 ayes. We uh, move now to uh, the Van Hollen Amendment in, 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 in the uh, nature of a substitute to H.R. 10. This inserts information sharing provisions, including privacy and the Civil Liberties Board. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Davis. No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays votes yes. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes no. Ms. Ros Leighton. Ms. Ros Leighton votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. La Tourette. Mr. La Tourette votes no. Mr. Osi. Mr. Osi votes no. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Cannon. Mr. Schrock. Mr. Schrock votes no. Mr. Duncan. Yes. Mr. Duncan votes yes. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Teaberry. Mr. Teaberry votes no. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Cantor. Mr. Cantor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Owens. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Rupersberger. Mr. Rupersberger votes aye. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes aye. You are recorded as an aye. Okay. Mr. Duncan votes no. Any other members wish to vote or change your vote? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Chairman, there are 20 Report. ayes and 22 nays. Okay. Um, Before we call um, Van Hollen Amendment Number Two, Ms. Christopher, would you raise? We would like to ask unanimous consent in his amendment uh, to strike lines, to restore lines four through nine. No, four through eight. Is it? Lines four through eight on page nine, and renumber accordingly. Is there objection? Reserving the right to object, uh, Mr. Chairman. What what what's that's all? What's this all about? <laughs> oh, just a correcting amendment. No. I yield to the. Uh, is, is this just to make the change to conform to the fact that there's not the privacy board in here? That's correct. Okay. I withdraw uh, my. I thought uh, that was. I thought that already been done at the desk. But I no. withdraw my reservation. All right. With that. Um, Mr. Van Hollen, I'd be happy to voice this unless you'd like a recorded vote. The chair is prepared to accept this amendment. Uh, if, if there's no objection, we can voice it again and then see if we want to real quick. Yeah. I, I All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, um, if there are no further amendments, the questions on the amendment in the nature of a substitute, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. I move that the Committee on Government Reform report H.R. 10 as amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The questions on favorably reporting H.R. 10 to the House, all in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. H.R. 10, the 9-11 Recommendations Implementation Act is ordered reported in amendment to the House. Mr. Chairman, I request the uh, requisite number of days to file minority views. Uh, without objection, it's so ordered. And uh, I also ask unanimous consent staff to be authorized to make technical conforming corrections. Without objection, so ordered. Meetings adjourned. In 1970, she became the third woman to make the FBI's most wanted list. And from that point, Angela Davis spent 16 months in jail before being acquitted of murder and kidnapping charges. She published her first collection of essays.